Good morning and welcome to today's conference, Retention and Research, Supporting Our People to Stay. I'm Professor Joanne Garside, I'm Strategic Director of the Health and Wellbeing Academy here at the University of Huddersfield and I'm delighted to be hosting this conference in partnership with colleagues from NHS England. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Victoria Bagshaw. I work in the uh, NHS England um, Nursing Directorate. And as Joanne said, a, a real privilege um, to be here, um, not just alongside um, university colleagues, but alongside all our speakers. Um, retention is so important. Um, so being here today to discuss the how we create climates where all our people are happy, fulfilled and thrived um, is, is really essential. So I'm really delighted um, with that list of speakers who are going to help us think about doing that. So the formalities. Today we're going to keep really strictly to time. Um, we plan to have a break at 11 o'clock um, and again for lunch at one o'clock. The event's been recorded and will be available shortly after the conference uh, via the university's YouTube channel and we'll send that out to you early next week. There'll be opportunities to ask questions to our speakers, so please do pose questions or make comments using the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, presenter slides and a summary of the question and answers will also be shared after the conference. Unfortunately, we might not have time to answer all the questions, but we'll collate a response and get them out to you in a digital conference pack early next week. We also have the chat function, please say hello. Uh, be good to know who's out there um, and as we go through the day it would be great to share any ideas, any solutions or things that are going on in your organisation that might be linked to the topics that we're talking about today. Um, so please do use the chat for that but keep the questions for the question and answer uh, box. If you'd like to contact us uh, for any reason um, on a personal basis please use the Health and Wellbeing Academy um, uh, web address um, and Hannah will share that in the chat. Lastly, uh, some of you may have seen the fantastic work uh, that Scriberia undertake, which involves live scribing to visually capture the discussions from today's event. Jules is our scribe and we'll be sharing the work in progress through the breaks uh, and the completed art artwork will be sent out with the conference pack. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Before we hear from our first keynote speaker, I'd like to introduce Professor Tim Thornton. He's the Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at the University of Huddersfield, and he'd just like to say a few words uh, before we get the conference started. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Joanne, and uh, thank you, Victoria. Uh, a very warm welcome, everyone, uh, to the University of Huddersfield uh, for today's retention and research supporting our people to stay conference. Uh, you've all joined us at a very exciting time here at Huddersfield as we look forward to the first building on our new National Health Innovation Campus, which is opening next year. Indeed, today uh, we will be celebrating the groundbreaking for that first building, the Daphne Steel Building, named after the inspirational nurse who became the first black matron in Britain here in West Yorkshire. This transformative project will improve the health outcomes for the people of our region and will lead innovation in healthcare for the north of England. As you are only too well aware, there's never been a time when health professionals have been more in demand to meet the demands of patient care and address health inequalities. Our new campus will train up the next generation of health professionals with the rapid expansion of courses in nursing, midwifery, allied health and human sciences, and indeed support the retention initiatives, which are the focus of your proceedings today. The National Health Innovation Campus will work with partners across the region to address some of the health and well-being issues that challenge us here in Yorkshire and the Humber, including high levels of obesity, the, some of the lowest levels of life expectancy for men and women, and indeed some of the highest rates of death in infancy. Partnership is indeed built into the campus with an important presence in the first buildings already planned for Locala and the Calderdale and Huddersfield Foundation Trust. 
The Daphne Steel Building will feature specialist clinical facilities, uh, world-leading research facilities, as well as a wide range of public-facing clinics. And far beyond the immediate health and care impact, the campus will deliver a major boost to productivity, economic development, regeneration, and jobs. And so, without further ado, I hope you all enjoy today's conference and find the packed list of presentations engaging and informative. And please do take the time to speak to one another and share all the wonderful work that you deliver. Thank you, and I wish you all the best for the day. Thank you for those uh, words, um, Tim, um, and it's fabulous to see um, the new um, groundbreaking of the new building um, going up today. So um, that's great stuff. So without further ado, um, maybe a little bit ahead of time, I'm going to um, let us get straight into our speaker because we've got a really, really packed um, agenda. So um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Libby McManus, who's a strategic nurse advisor for um, NHS England. Thanks, Libby. Thanks, Victoria. Well, uh, you want my slides, don't you? Apologies, people. Just uh, bear with me whilst I do the technical bit. Okay, we're all good there. Can I just do a check that people can hear me and can hear the, and can see the slides? We can hear you, but we uh, we had your slides up, but we haven't got them on now. They're gone. So if you just want to share them again, reshare. <laughs> Oh, we had them then, Libby, but they've gone again. Apologies, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> We've got them now, Libby, but then that's it. We've got them. Perfect. Perfect. Let's give it a go, shall we? You still got Thanks. them. So um, apologies, people, but hello, good morning and welcome to you all. Um, thank you to the University of Huddersfield, to Joe and colleagues and to NHSE, um, uh, especially Victoria, joining forces with the National Programme Managers in the retention team and creating what I know is going to be a top-notch learning event for everybody. Um, thank you to you all for finding the time. There are loads of you on the call, which is fabulous. Um, and that means you're prioritising not only your own learning and leadership, but increasing the chances of success when it comes to keeping our people, our teams and our colleagues happy and productive in our NHS. You're going to hear from some amazing teams and individuals about what they know, so the factual stuff, the evidence and research, and importantly for many of us, what they've done, how they've applied that learning from learning. Um, it's inspirational stuff, and I think you'll all agree that we need both inspiration 
hope and importantly you'll see the plans that support that too throughout the day I hope that what happens is that whilst I I might depress you in a moment actually in terms of kind of where we are now um others it will fall to others to lift you such that by the end of today your brains are buzzing with a mix of both perhaps new things but also some confirmatory thoughts as well so let's just uh i want to just check that the slide has moved could someone move the slides for me is that possible uh my my, my support crew not whilst you're sharing we're still on slide one okay um, if, can you click in and try and move it again in powerpoint yeah there we go yeah we've got two now yeah so uh, people know that the pandemic has exacerbated the global nursing shortages um and increased stress and strain on on the health workforce um, the International Council of Nurses uh, reports that 90% of national nurses associations are either somewhat or extremely concerned um, that heavy workloads and insufficient resourcing, burnout and stress related to the pandemic are resulting in increased numbers of nurses who've left the profession and an increased reported rate of intention to leave uh, this year, that was back in 2022. It's really sobering stuff, isn't it? And then recent evidence in the UK, so between the University of Sheffield and the University of Bath just last year, indicates that work-related stress, shortages of staff and pay are the top three reasons why staff are leaving the NHS. That's all staff. Their survey of just over 1,500 NH staff, of which or of whom 350 odd were nurses, also indicates an upward trend in staff applying for jobs outside of the NHS, and that one in three staff aspire to leave the NHS within five years. It, it is really sobering, isn't it? So the RCN surveyed 6,500 nurse leavers last year who also attributed work-related stress as top reasons for staff leaving the register alongside workplace culture and impacts of the pandemic. You all know about strike action relating to pay and working conditions. We know that staff engagement and experience drive retention. And what NHS England is doing is working with systems and local organizations to make improvements in the following areas. And, and you're gonna know what these are. So flexible working, health and well-being, reward and recognition, leadership and team working, and inclusive and compassionate cultures and staff voice. And if we were in a great big room now, I'd be asking people to kind of raise their hand and say, well, who knows what those are? Uh, and I suspect you all know that these themes are those that make up our NHS People Promise, which was developed by staff and um, for staff and by staff. It's a promise that we make to each other. Um, literally to each other about the you know the way we work to work together to improve our experience and those themes as I say have come from those people who work inside the NHS the descriptions in that people promise are what we should all be able to say about our working in the NHS by 2024 and quite frankly that's not that far away is it So, established in April 2020, the National Retention Programme supports the government's manifesto commitment to deliver 50,000 more nurses in the NHS in England by March 2024. Again, not that far away now. And the plan's contribution within that 50,000 through retention alone is over 7,000 nurses. So the National Retention Programme is built on strong evidence base for how we improve staff experience and engagement and increase the number of staff that we retain. As of, so I've got some data here, which is, um, which is 
uh, positive, it's nuggets of good news. In August 2022, the nurse Libra rate was 7.5%. Hot off the press, I do know that they have reduced again through January. So January is the latest data uh, that I've got. It was 7.1% down from 7.3% in December. So they sound like small numbers, but they are early signs of improvement starting uh, for those of you with improvement minds, starting to join together as a trend. And a note on midwifery there too, I would say that the midwifery lever rate is currently 6.4%, which is really positive. It's the same rate as last January 2022. Um, it hit a peak, but, it, but it's been reducing since, which is really positive news. So well done to everyone for the work you're doing uh, in, in all those areas. The programme, as is everything, is operating in a very challenging context against the backdrop of that global nursing shortage that we talked about, high levels of burnout and stress, the pandemic, the cost of living crisis, which dependent upon where you are in the, you know, um, across the countries at the moment, uh, makes a real difference to the choices that nurses, midwives and others make about where they work. Let me just move on a slide. Uh, Apologies, I think I've missed one out there. I've talked better about the priorities in um, uh, uh, earlier in the programme. The priorities for 2022 and 23 um, uh, are all about building on the strong foundation of evidence, testing and data and scaling up that work that you've, you know, what's proven to work. So the national priorities for this 22-23 are to support systems and NHS organisations to deliver five high impact actions for nursing and midwifery. And I'll, I'll share a slide with you about those in just a minute, um, which provide focus on supporting both early and late stage careers through preceptorship and pension flexibilities, implementing legacy mentoring and improving our menopause support offer huge um uh, a huge set of uh, actions there secondly to continue to provide intensive support through those exemplar sites and some of you on the call will be exemplar sites and you're going to hear from some of those which are implementing that bundle of interventions those high impact actions aligned to the nhs people promise and thirdly to work with ics's so integrated care systems to develop bespoke retention plans for every ICS, because what we're seeing nationally and locally is that it does depend on where you, you know, what your community's like, what the people are like, what the geography's like, what transport facilities are like, and what that cost of living is like, um, dependent upon your locality, your area. So those national priorities for nursing and midwifery uh, into 22-23 are um, focused on that early and late career support to uh, nurses and midwives. And one of the first things in that box on the left there, you can see experience at work. We're encouraging you to use the self-assessment tool. And I know from talking to many of you that people have either really not liked filling that in um, or didn't know much about it, depending where you where you are within an organisation. Um, and I think I would encourage you, together with support from your integrated care systems, from your regional uh, support officers, to think about how you use that self-assessment tool to help benchmark, to help gather that global and national evidence that will really help you focus. And one of the things within that experience at work area on the left there is really challenging ourselves to focus on flex. So we talk about flexible working, but what does that really mean? And um, we're going to hear lots about it later, but I know that I need to challenge myself when it comes to flexible working. You know, that the patterns of work that, that I expected myself to do, you know, much earlier in my career are not those that people early in their career or late in their career these days want to work. And so as I suspect many of you on the call are people who can have an influence on just how flexible you can be as an organisation, as a ward, as a department, as a community hub in employing people uh, to, to, to work more flexibly. 
In terms of early career, you're all going to know that we've got the, the you know, the national preceptorship um, uh, framework there ready to help you. Uh, you should have implemented it already, but, but really have a think about the accreditation system that goes with that, that can help you demonstrate what a good employer you are and what support people will get early in their career. And then on to later career, you know, um, I, I consider myself a, a, a late career nurse at the moment. Um, supporting, we need to support nurses and midwives to work for longer. Um, think about the think about the wisdom, um, the experience, the support, um, the intelligence those people in their later careers can offer to everybody within uh, within the workforce, uh, and and those who have entered into kind of um, uh, uh, legacy mental roles tell great stories about what that feels like at this point in their career. I'm saying this point because I'm uh, slightly more gray haired than many of you and uh, know what it feels like to think about leaving a legacy. I'd also just say that um, I think the work that NHS, NHSE have been doing um, to focus on pensions has been uh, incredible and making it making it really easy for people to join webinars, um, to download appropriate toolkits, to help people understand what pension, what flexible pension and what flexible working might mean for them. Uh, so really great stuff. My final slide here is really about working with those five high impact actions. Um, because what the evidence has told us is that one using, you know, one, one intervention on its own doesn't have the lasting impact and doesn't have as great an impact as taking these five interventions together um, and focusing on them. So if you you know, if you really want to think about what are those levers that you can pull that you, you know, you can take action on, uh, think about those five high impact actions and how they might help you uh, in, in your organisational or your system way of working. Again, again, I'll say, you know, it starts with that complete the nursing and midwifery self-assessment tool. It is there to support you. I know that it can be, it might feel wordy, it might feel um, uh, difficult at first, but for those people who've used it well, it's really given them some rich data, some benchmarking, and then access to that global and national evidence that supports what you want to do locally. The preceptorship framework goes without uh, goes without saying, you know, it's there, it's available to everybody. It should have been implemented. Really think about how you use that a, a, as a way of not just attracting people, but, you know, this is about retention. How can you apply the principles that go with that preceptorship framework throughout someone's career, not just early career, but maybe later career too? There's some excellent, excellent principles in there. Uh, the menopause support uh, that's out there is huge. And I'm going to say, you know, menopause support isn't only for women to read. It is about our male colleagues to understand and support with too. Uh, and when you're developing those guidelines, I think it's really helpful to have um, mixed gender groups who can help take those forward. Pensions I've talked about a little bit, and there's a big offer out at the moment in terms of, and I wonder if we can get that out there through um, uh, this, uh, this day, the number of pensions webinars that are available at the moment uh, have, been, have been flagged out to organisations, I would say, really take, take advantage of that and help people understand uh, what that might mean for them, but also as leaders, you know, you're all going to be leaders within your systems. Why might people want to take pension support? Why might people, you know, what are the what are the motivators for people to do that, uh, such that you can support them and understand what it means? It certainly doesn't mean the end of somebody's career. Um, so, so have a think about how you do that. And then legacy mentoring and late career nurses, you know, um, I said it in the previous slide, but what an opportunity for those people 
who are who consider themselves in their late career, um, who consider themselves moving towards a, a, a retirement option and perhaps working less, um, helping them think about not just leaving, but but how they might want to exit an organization over time, leaving a legacy uh, that truly means something, either within their specialty or across a number of specialties. Um, I worked with a legacy mentor uh, a good few years ago now, and the joy she had in her everyday life coming to work was, uh, it was visible, it was palpable, um, and she made a difference to everybody she met, including me as a chief nurse. Um, uh, within that organization. So, so really do think about that and learning from those organizations, um, learning from those organizations who've already implemented and want to share with you through um, this program. In, in ending and passing you back um, to Victoria and to Joe, um, the only thing I wish is that I could see you all um, you know, I see my own presentation slides and, and notes, and I wish that I could see you all and feel the energy in the room and, you know, be able to use that um, to harness our unique human interactions that I, I miss dearly, uh, yet recognise the need to change our learning spaces. Um, perhaps this many of you wouldn't have been able to make it to Huddersfield, uh, and it's an opportunity for you to learn in a different way. But um, your leadership matters. Uh, so what you do as a leader right now matters and will make a difference. You know, turning those ambitions that we set out in the people promise, turning the ambitions and pledges from the people promise into reality, it takes action. And some of those will be your personal leadership actions. You know, what you choose to do will make a difference right now um, thank you for listening uh, and let me hand you back to to victoria and to joe thank you so much for that presentation uh libby really really interesting uh perspectives to to just get that view of uh, the strategic plans um I'm delighted that we're starting uh, getting questions in the question and answer, but if you've got anything that you want to talk to, to Libby or ask Libby about, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to see how uh, the People Promise the People Plan is, is uh, being implemented in practice. Have, have you got any uh, examples or questions? Um, uh, and again, thank you everybody for putting a hello uh, in the, the chat. If you've not had a chance to do that, that please, please do. Uh, it's great to see that we've got representation um, across across England, across, I don't know whether we've seen anybody from Scotland. If we have, please, please do give us a wave. Um, so yeah, and, and everybody taking this subject um, uh, so as a, such a high priority. We are a little bit ahead of time, but we've got uh, James uh, waiting in the wings. So, James, are we able to start your presentation a little bit earlier? Um, I'd like to introduce Professor James Bushan. He's a senior fellow at the Health Foundation. I'm really looking forward to hearing his presentation on the global healthcare workforce position and threats on the, the horizon. Are you happy? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm also, so uh, I can wave from Scotland. Um, I don't know if there's others from yeah, I'm in Edinburgh at the moment. Uh, I'm very sorry uh, not to be able to be with you in Huddersfield. I've never been there, so I was looking forward to my, my first visit. Um, what I'm going to do now is just uh, share my, my PowerPoint slides. And um, essentially what I'm going to be trying to do, I think, is, is two different dimensions of um, context. Um, the first really very much is to uh, look at the, the global context. I was asked to give some sense to that in terms of the, uh, what's going on in other countries. Um, I think we, uh, we all recognize that during the pandemic and beyond it, we are all connected. Different countries um, in different ways are connected. And, we are currently uh, at a situation globally which is unprecedented in terms of the, the scale 
of the healthcare workforce challenge across the globe. Um, it was there before the pandemic, but the pandemic has accelerated it in terms of um, shortages, particularly. So we are we're not alone in facing shortages, um, and we need to be aware that other countries are also coming up with their own solutions to to their own shortage challenges. Second point, second context, really is to look in a little bit more detail at um, what's going on uh, in England. And the context I'm applying there is essentially looking at retention as, as one of several major uh, policy directions in terms of trying to get the numbers up uh, crudely uh, within the healthcare workforce. I have noticed in the Q&A already, uh, a couple of people have asked for the profession of other nursing. And I will have a, a, a small amount of data for other professions, but um, mainly I'm presenting data relates to, to nurses. And um, that's not through choice, it's, it's through what's available. And particularly globally, uh, there is more likelihood of, of data on nursing there, than there is on some of the other allied health professions. So um, in a sense, that's a, a condition from the start. Um, the, the second thing is that the global information I'm drawing from it, uh, comes from a report that I published um, last Monday. And I've put the, the link uh, in the, the chat box for those of you who are interested. It's published by International Council of Nurses and it's um, freely available to be downloaded. So um, in terms of um, my structure for my presentation, um, for some reason I'm not getting the slides moving. Ah, there we go. So um, a little bit on global context, uh, then uh, a little bit more detail on the context in England, looking at the uh, alternatives to retention, pl placing retention in the broader context in terms of the, its likely impact. And then uh, conclude by summarizing some of the key aspects that are coming through to me and, and leaving you with um, a few discussion points to consider. So, um, what do we mean by global shortage? Well, um, there are a few studies around, and uh, as always with shortage, it depends on your definition. There's no kind of universally accepted definition of what a, a shortage is, but this one, which uh, was published um, just a few months ago, looked across the globe and took as the, the benchmark measure, what would it require for a country to reach 80 out of 100 on the universal health care effective coverage index. So without going into that in, in detail, that's a fairly basic minimum assessment of what needs to be in place uh, for um, a re relatively healthy population. And I'll just draw your attention to the numbers in red. Uh, applying that on the basis of that uh, index, and this is pre-pandemic estimate, but uh, there were a shortage of around about six and a half million doctors, 30 and a half million nurses, and, and about three million pharmacists, pharmaceutical personnel. So huge numbers, uh, not surprisingly, most prominent in low and uh, lower middle income countries. Um, and even within most countries that have a higher level, uh, there are usually big challenges in terms of getting the right distribution. So the staff uh, are not necessarily in the best place to have an optimal impact. So that is just uh, a backdrop uh, to put uh, in context some of our own uh, more precise challenges. And uh, if you look at the impact of COVID, which um, has then impacted uh, in all countries across the world, it's had a huge negative impact uh, in the workforce. And these are just uh, some key headlines from the report I mentioned. Just draw your attention to, for example, uh, surveys across the world, somewhere between 40 to 80% of nurses have been reporting some type of anxiety, stress, depression, burnout, or PTSD, um, uh, more prominent in some care areas than others. Very marked increase in absenteeism uh, and reported intention to leave, and in some countries, increase in, in leaving rates. And 
Obviously, if, um, if we're focusing on retention at this conference, uh, we've got to take account of the COVID and post-COVID impact and the likelihood that many healthcare professionals hung on during COVID um, with very, very intense pressure and uh, cannot sustain that forever. So that's why we're seeing in many systems, absenteeism increasing, intention to leave responses increasing. And in some countries where there is data, we are seeing an increase in those leaving. So um, that obviously is a challenge. Another manifestation uh, of concern uh, is a very marked increase in strikes by health workers, uh, something like 60% being monitored across the globe. Uh, we are um, in that 60%, as we all know. Um, and I think we also all know that whilst the, the primary focus of strikes and action is about um, restitution or improved pay, uh, when you talk to those who are involved, uh, many of them are also concerned about working conditions, safe staffing uh, and workload. So uh, again, we are not alone. Uh, these are issues that are going on in other countries. We need to be aware of that when we look at our own context and situation. And just a couple of final points on uh, retention, global impact. These are a few studies looking at costs of turnover or absence, and um, they use different methods, so they're not directly comparable. Uh, but what we do see is very significant cost implications of nurses and other health workers leaving or, or being absent. Um, I'm not suggesting that we can be totally reductionist and just look at those figures in isolation, but they give a sense of the financial impact and also give us uh, a scale to measure against um, any costs of investing in trying to reduce turnover, improve retention. So again, uh, you can look at that report if you want to see some of the more uh, detailed assessments. What I'm going to do now then, that's a very quick global backdrop, is look in um, a bit more detail at some work that colleagues at the Health Foundation uh, have done and I've had some involvement in. We uh, last year published our first uh, detailed workforce projections uh, looking forward for about 15 years. Uh, based on uh, models that we commissioned and developed. So they're um, independent um, and therefore allows us to run different uh, scenarios and simulations and look at uh, what the, the outcome of those are. And currently we've got two models, one looking at the nursing workforce in England and the second looking at the primary care workforce. And today I'm going to briefly talk about the nursing one. Uh, we published a report last summer, July, um, it's, it's in the references. And what we were doing uh, is fairly standard kind of projection work, which is uh, you look at where you are and you then, um, based on your best assumptions using the model, you look forward, uh, taking account of two or three different scenarios. And what I've got here really is the, the current policy scenario, which is just carrying on doing as we're doing. Uh, an optimistic scenario, which one focuses on um, ways of in increasing recruitment attention and a pessimistic one, which is um, considering a more negative impact, uh, a long-term impact of the pandemic particularly. Uh, I don't have time to go into the, the technical detail here, but essentially what I'm gonna do is just briefly uh, illustrate uh, what we found when we looked at three possible policy interventions um, related to ret improving retention, uh, looking at uh, international recruitment, and looking at uh, the scale of new domestic education of, of undergraduate nurses. Um, those of you who, who read the papers um, or look at media will be aware that um, the um, long-term plan, which we're, we still await some of the, the leaks, um, reflect on uh, similar assessments of looking at um, different, where are the major policy levers essentially, and those are train more, retain better, uh, or recruit internationally. Uh, there's a fourth, which is looking at returners, but that's um, 
a pool that has been quite well fished already, so it's probably not going to provide the scale. So um, we looked at um, what kind of shifts in current policy could help close the, the nurse supply gap. And this first uh, table here looks at the current policy scenario and the optimistic scenario, um, and then looks at uh, nurse supply as measured against our estimates of demand. And um, what you can see there, if you just look at the red figures particularly, is that we were projecting that there will continue to be a significant gap 2023-24. Uh, However, if you looked at the optimistic scenario and looked at that by 2030, we could be in a situation where uh, the numbers have gone from negative red into uh, potential um, surplus. In fact, this obviously depends on the different interventions in the optimistic supply being fully funded and, into, and, and implemented. And uh, what I'm going to do now then is just is break that down. Let's look at uh, the three options I mentioned, domestic training, nurse retention, international recruitment. Domestic scenario, if we looked at the uh, ability for the system to increase the number of pre-reg undergraduate nurses it was bringing in, uh, supporting through training, uh, and getting into the workforce, we we did estimate that there could be a a significant increase under the optimistic scenario, which is the the green column by 2030. Um, and we were looking at historically achievable increases. So these are not um, out of the ballpark in terms of uh, we've seen this type of increase uh, in domestic supply in previous years or decades. So. That in itself was going to contribute potentially quite a significant increase in numbers. Um, on retention, uh, we also did our projections based on assumptions, and uh, we think there can be a more modest overall net increase uh, in terms of the contribution of retention. That in part is because, as we all know, we've already heard that much of the workforce is aging. So there's this significant chunk of outflow, which really is not going to be uh, open to a huge amount of modification, uh, whereas uh, there is scope to look at retention uh, for those who are not retiring and try and improve that through the range of interventions that we'll, I think, hear a lot more about today. Uh, third intervention, international recruitment, um, and essentially, uh, the message here is uh, that if England does not continue to internationally recruit at a significant level, uh, it's unlikely to uh, achieve uh, moving into positive territory. And again, we looked at numbers which were actually probably under the actual number of nurses currently being recruited from other countries. So. Uh, achievable and um, despite some re rhetoric about it reducing uh, or ending, uh, our own modeling suggests that it will have to continue. There may be scope to taper it um, as we, or if we see more nurses coming out of domestic education, but there's a balancing act to be achieved there in terms of alignment between those two uh, types of policy intervention. and. Um, it's unlikely that international recruitment will, will disappear altogether. I just flag one point here, which is we we, we've we taken a, a somewhat arrogant view, I think, in recent years that everyone wants to come and work in the UK and that we don't need to conserve, concern ourselves about either competition or uh, countries coming here and trying to recruit our nurses and, and doctors. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, that is happening. Uh, Australia notably is, um, kicking into very active international recruitment and it will and is targeting, for example, uh, general practitioners and nurses working in intensive care, critical care. So we will need to uh, take account of that in, in future modeling where we're connected and connected doesn't just mean 
we can go and recruit. It also means countries will be coming here and recruiting. Long-term context on international recruitment. Uh, this is data from the Nursing Midwifery Council. It just shows back to 1990, uh, the number of new international nurses coming on the register in the UK, uh, the red are non-EU countries, the blue are uh, EU countries. And you can obviously see that we are now at historically unprecedented levels in terms of numbers of nurses from other countries registering. And the vast majority of those uh, since the Brexit vote in 2016 have been uh, not from the European Union. Uh, Philippines, India, Nigeria would be the, the most obvious countries. So um, where does that all leave us? Uh, if we look beyond the NHS, and often we don't, but we need to, because these are sectors that also employ healthcare professionals looking at general practice, um, the Numbers are not great. Uh, our projections essentially under any scenarios look like uh, general practice nursing and adult social care nursing is going to be challenged to even retain the numbers it has now, given uh, the overall movements within the UK labour market. Right. Um, I'm conscious that I've run through that very quickly, uh, but Hopefully what I've done in terms of take home messages, one is that uh, the, the global scale of shortages is huge. We have our own problems, um, but we are not alone. And uh, we've got to take account of our connections with other countries in terms particularly of international recruitment. Uh, our impact on low income countries, I think, is cause for concern. Um, we are recruiting heavily from countries that are on the so-called red list. And uh, I think you know, there's a reputation we need to be sure that we maintain. Uh, I think we can also assume we will see more outflow uh, due to active international recruitment by other countries. And then when we look at the, the modeling that I very briefly highlighted, and you can look in more detail in the report, what it shows is that um, retention will be essential, uh, but uh, it's unlikely to have the same numerical impact in terms of contribution to growth, as will uh, international recruitment in the short to midterm, and as potentially would increasing the numbers of uh, undergraduate entrants. Uh, that would be on the, uh, you know, the three, four year plus Retention is necessary, but it's it's not in itself going to be sufficient, I think is, is the, the take home message there. What I'm gonna do now just is finish with two or three slides or discussion points, just highlight some issues I think are worth coming back to during the day if you have the opportunity. Uh, the first one is just, uh, this is a composite slide, again, from the, the report that's in, in the chat, where we um, collated the evidence on what works in terms of essentially retention of nurses. We looked at the evidence uh, pre-pandemic, which is the first part of the block. And we also looked at uh, what was coming through uh, during and, and now, I'm not gonna use the word beyond pandemic, but, but having been through several acute phases of the pandemic. And this is the kind of global research key messages. And uh, the first box there, um, I think you will already all be talking about all these issues as, as part of the potential policy solution. And um, we've already touched on, on this, that th this is in essence a shopping list. And the weight that you put to any one of these uh, individual factors will vary a lot depending on, on the context, on policy priorities and also on the, the shape and, and motivations of the workforce that you're trying to um, keep for longer uh, in bigger numbers. The second box is um, much more driven by what's happened in the last two or three years. And um, some of those are more relevant to low income countries. There are, there are many health professionals in the world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, who still do not have 
vaccine vaccination. So that that's a, a kind of undercurrent that needs to be addressed. But if you look at the other bullet points there, again, I, I suspect that you're already looking at most of them. Uh, and again, the key message is um, how do we bundle the right number and sequence of these interventions to to get most effect to be most cost effective. Uh, just in terms of the England data, what are some of the wider implications? So um, we we estimated on the 2022 work that the, the government's 50K target could be met, but we're, we're essentially critical of that as a top-down target, which um, isn't planning-based and has nothing to say about where the, the 50,000 nurses should be. Uh, for example, it's evident that um, community nursing has uh, more of a challenge proportionately in terms of getting the numbers up and retention up, but the the, the target is just uh, a generic 50K. So we need to fine tune our planning in order to improve the support and ensure that it's targeted in the right areas. Even if we do meet the 50K target, our estimate was that that was not going to be sufficient to meet the current shortfall unless we get into the optimistic scenario interventions. And um, particularly in the mid to long term, we can, uh, we can achieve significant numerical growth in the NHS, but we uh, remain concerned about general practice, adult social care. And there is this potential, we believe, to, to get to a better place by 2030, 31. Uh, but that this requires planning and funding, uh, which are two of the three biggies that we always talk about. The third is politics. And there needs to be political will uh, to uh, implement a long-term plan rather than the current long-term plan specifically, but we need that long-term focus. So um, long-term planning, um, not a quick fix where we're looking five, 10 years plus. Top-down targets are not themselves effective enough to address supply demand shortfalls. We need to be looking at geography sector uh, in terms of supply and demand estimates. We need also to be looking at um, costing and implementing effectively. And this, I think, very much part of the current discussions and debate around the long-term plan. Joined up policymaking, and under, uh, we, we've got good research on some of the drivers of supply now, particularly retention, um, and we need to act on those, make sure that they are part of the assumptions that we use when we're looking at projections and, and being honest and realistic about uh, what needs to be in place. And one of our key messages, retention alone is not going to get us where, where we need to be. It's important but there's more work to be done beyond it. And um, there are big gaps in terms of data. It may be improving in some areas, but um, we do need better metrics. Um, um, for example, uh, at local level, the ability to uh, assess quickly what's happening with turnover and absence and, and what to do about it. Finally, just my last slide, just kind of opening up a bit. Some thoughts about, I know this is very much a research day, so uh, how do we need to ensure that the research that is underway is commissioned, can be commissioned, uh, can contribute? Um, obviously, uh, it has to um, link to policy or assess policy. Um, there is uh, historically some risks, I think, uh, associated with many small scale unconnected research studies going on. We need to be looking, I think, much more at scale here uh, and build on research that uh, is transferable and methods that can be replicated. Uh, we need to be looking forward in terms of what may happen, what can happen. I think we need to be a little modest when we talk about solutions and being clear about which context they can be effective in. Uh, we need to ensure that those involved at the front line 
uh, are very much uh, in the process of development, interpretation, and development of any recommendations. I think it's critical that research that is commissioned gets in the public domain within a decent timescale in order to help inform policy direction. And um, reinstating that as much as possible, we need to look at a, a progressive research agenda in both senses of the word so that we don't have isolated one-off studies, but we build one on top of the other, we move forward, we develop a better understanding of what the key issues are. Uh, thanks for your attention. Those are the three uh, main references that I drew from. Uh, I think I may uh, I've talked uh, a little beyond my 20 minutes, but we're still, I think, more or less essentially on time. Um, I'll try and answer uh, anything in the chat Q&A uh, in terms of typing, but I'll, I'll hand back now to um, the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, James. Um, really, really um, interesting um, presentation. I think um, your challenge at the end in terms of how do we utilise and draw on that research um, to, to make a real difference in terms of, of the solutions and vice versa is, is absolutely critical. And I guess I was... Um, really um, struck by the data at the beginning of your presentation around um, the impact um, of COVID and PTSD. Mm. And as we all know, um, PTSD um, doesn't go away instantaneously. And I guess um, the, the challenge for us all will be how do we continue to um, challenge and to commit to the health and well-being initiatives that have been ch uh, started in um, COVID and continue those in the years to come and not just forget that, you know, five years post-COVID, actually there's, there will still be a significant health and well-being um, need for um, all of our colleagues, um, not just those that, that have um, trained um, and initially worked in the UK, but all of our internationally educated um, colleagues from the various professions that come and join us in the UK. So um, thank you um, for that presentation. Can I, um, we've got some, we've got a huge number um, of questions. So I know we're not going to get through um, all of them, but as Joanne mentioned at the beginning of the day, that we will make sure that um, we collate all the questions and answers that we've not been able to get through um, today and, um, and uh send that information out in terms of the post-conference um, pack. So, so Libby, can I invite you to come back onto screen, um, please? And we'll, um, we've kind of, we've got a few, um, we've got a few questions, I guess, for um, both, um, both James and um, okay. Libby. Um, so, um, Libby, if it's okay, can I can I start with you? And it, uh, kind of one of the questions really struck out to me because it's a, a a passion of mine around um, legacy mentors <laughs> and how fabulous um, they are. Um, and colleagues um, were asking, have you any thoughts around? Um, the terminology because yeah. they've um, they've faced some pushback um, in terms of age discrimination. Yeah. Do, do you know, um, Victoria? Thank you, and thank you for asking the question. Um, I I agree with you. I think it's a I think it's a really strange term, isn't it? I think sometimes we start talking about things and come up with a label that actually doesn't suit. And I want to say, you know, it's up to you to call, to give titles to people that mean something within your particular organization or your particular system. Do not feel like you have to call somebody a legacy mentor cause someone at NHSE or in a university or wherever has said that's what it is. Call somebody whatever works for you. Um, and uh yeah, that, that, that's what I would say. I must admit the name when I first heard it, it didn't sit comfortably. Um, so, yeah, so feel free um, to, 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 to make it mean something to you within your organisations is what I'd say. Wonderful. Thanks, Libby. Um, my question goes to both of you. It's not my question. It, it's sort of a little bit of a, a collation of the questions coming through the chat and the, the questions that we've had previously. Um, when, when we're looking at the research, it's mainly research from the nursing profession. How can we make sure that the research 
is inclusive of uh, nursing midwifery and allied health uh, colleagues. I'll put that to Libby first and then James, you might. Yeah, ask. sure. Well, well, it's inevitable, isn't it? So I'm sitting here as a, as a nurse and somebody who has uh, led, managed, worked amongst nurses, midwives, AHPs for years. Um, but there are some, there are some <clears throat> political things, there are some priorities that drive the way in which we look at the data and therefore present things, Joe, isn't there? And, and, and there is more data. There is loads of data relating to um, people, to staff within all our organisations that can be cut in many different ways to help you locally uh, focus in on whichever group of staff or whichever service, because quite frequently this isn't about a single group of staff, is it? It's about the services that we wrap around patients. Um, I, you know, that, that, that's kind of why we're here, isn't it? So how do the people who wrap around patients work together and how do we use that data to focus on them in a way which gives us the levers? You know, I keep talking about these levers that you can pull, that as a leader, as a manager, you can pull. So uh, the data exists. It can be cut. Talk to your, you know, talk to your um, uh, talk to your retention leads, talk to your program leads in, in, in workforce to help bring that together. But, you know, J James might want to add something in terms of the data that's there and that he's seen that um, that tells a different story. Uh, happy to to add my thoughts. I, I think um, a starting point would be that uh, regions and, and nationally, yes, you need to be able to uh, monitor what's going on in a comparable fashion across the system at um, trust level and, and perhaps even below. The the challenge with with that, however, obviously, is that the the data tends to be um, at best a little out of date. By the time it, it, it gets up, it gets cleaned, it gets presented. So I think that we're seeing some progress in, in speeding that up. But the the primary perspective, from my point of view, is, is more local and, and should be more or less an instant dashboard that's telling you, uh, as a manager, what your uh, absenteeism turnover um, rates are, uh, perhaps pushing more into other retention indicators such as uh, stability indexes, which can be quite helpful in terms of informing retention. But having that more or less as a, a live dashboard, so it's it's there to be reflected on almost on a daily basis in order that you can focus your efforts. The other, I guess, the, the new kid on the block, or, or they're, they're not even um, kids yet, some cases, the, the ICEs, I think, are, are, are being vested in quite a lot of um, responsibility in, in some aspects of workforce as well. And I think they will, they're at the right size, roughly, uh, to be able to assess uh, several labour markets, not too many, uh, but more than one. And, and I think that would allow us to get more specificity into just the differences that occur across different labour markets in terms of some of the, the factors that impact on retention. And many of these factors are outside of the, the, the employment contract, but need to be given full consideration, such as housing costs, such as is there a good school or not a good school, such as um, staff were working flexible shifts, what are the, the public transport availabilities out of ours. So there's there's a range of issues that need to be given consideration beyond the organisational metrics, uh, but it's important that the organisational metrics themselves are as uh, up-to-date uh, as is feasible. Um, thank you both. Can I... I'm struck by, um, I suppose, a bit of analogy that I've been talking to colleagues about, which is um, given our current workforce challenge, um, we won't recruit ourselves out of this um, position and neither will we um, through impacting um, on retention. 
get ourselves out of our um out of our kind of workforce challenge it's a it's a combination of all of those factors um i'm really interested in your thoughts though um particularly given that we're in a university um building and and we're doing this in collaboration uh with one of our uh with huddersfield university of huddersfield is your thoughts on how do we attract people into um our um into our profession particularly um, our pre-registration programs. I think, again, um, I'm not asking you to get drawn into the kind of the politics of it, but some of the things that have been put in the chat are around, you know, sh should we be thinking about um, uh, refunding degrees, the challenges of the bursaries, um, perhaps what strike action might have done in terms of professional profiles, etc. Um, so we're interested in, in both of your um, thoughts. James, I don't know if you want to start. Uh, yeah, happy to. I, I'll just, in fact, put uh, an answer in the Q&A, which kind of covers a bit of it. I think um, the, there was, um, there was a, a period during COVID when interest in the professions grew, mar grew markedly, and that also happened in other countries. That was a kind of early mid-phase when there was clapping every night, and I think a lot of people saw um, the worth of having a job uh, as a nurse or a physio or someone on the front line. And um, there was um, a huge opportunity there, I think, which um, unfortunately uh, we did not uh, grab as it successfully as we might. In part, that, that I think is due to uh, soon after we've got into the, the situation of um, uh, pay disputes, strikes, um, clear concerns about heavy workload for long periods of time for individuals. And I think you, you can't have that as your backdrop uh, and necessarily assume it's going to be easy to encourage more people to come in uh, to that type of employment, given that everyone knows a nurse or a physio or a pharmacist or at least one, because they're everywhere. So you have to recognize that the promotion of careers, the advertising, marketing careers, uh, has to be honest because people understand what's really going on. I think linked to that, if you look across the UK, we have um, what amounts to a natural experiment going on in various ways. So Scotland has retained the bursary uh, in, uh, in one shape for, for nurses. Scotland has not escaped the, the challenges that England is also experiencing. So um, reintroduction of bursaries may be of some help, but it is not a magic bullet. Um, the, the underlying issues in terms of uh, getting more undergraduates into universities so they can come out in three or four years as health professionals uh, tends to be university capacity, tends to be clinical placement limitations and blockages. There are uh, funding and structural issues which if addressed, would allow the volume that we uh, educate to be greater. Uh, whether or not we can encourage the greater volume to get to that point um, is, is a broader question, but there still are many more applicants to undergraduate nursing, for example, than there are places. Uh, so my sense is that in, in terms of priorities, it's, it's got to be looking at... Um, scaling up the capacity to handle more undergraduates. Thanks, James. Libby? I'm a can-do kind of girl, and I'm thinking, whilst retention and recruitment don't take the same actions necessarily, um, what is it that we're doing within organisations and within professions at the moment? It's really focusing on creating the conditions where people, well, either that people feel attracted to in the first place, so you're creating pull within, a, within an employment market, or creating the conditions where people want to stay and don't look and don't get to that, you know, one in three people are thinking about leaving the NHS in the next five years. Um, I think there is a lot that we can think about around 
the role models that we are, if there are 100, 189, it's just gone up, 189 people on the call, you know, we are all somehow role models when it comes to working within healthcare. Uh, and how do we connect with, um, you know, with schools, with communities, you know, the work you're doing within your ICS is how do you connect with communities with, um, uh, you know, widening participation, making it more of a, uh, a, an attractive set of professions uh, to more people. And, you know, that there are varying degrees of success around the country at the moment with some of that. But I think what, what programs do is pull together the learning system that's able to pick up on that really quickly. So what have the 23 exemplar sites been able to do? They have been able to share the implementation of that evidence-based stuff really, really quickly um, using, you know, using perhaps improvement science rather than research. And that's a whole other debate. But, you know, you just kind of go, let's let's use the evidence that we're building across the country. Um, I do think looking at values-based recruitment uh, really helps us if, if I go back 20 years in my career and think about values-based recruitment and thinking about how we, that was really engaging people before an assessment, before a recruitment process that said, do you know what, it's not like Holby City and it's not like casualty. Actually, here's what it's really like. And here are some healthcare assistants and here are some porters to talk to you about what life is really like. And what life is really like has to be attractive, doesn't it? Um, even the hard stuff. And if we are creating the conditions where people are attracted to that, they need to know that they're supported to grow and develop and that they need to know that they'll be supported when times are tough, because times will be tough either for them personally or for us or it or them as a system or organization. So I, I think there's we have to learn from the past, don't we, and use the evidence to guide how we now act. Uh, you know, I'm with James in that there are some wider perhaps uh, political and funding things that we can do to, to, to open the gates when it comes to, to recruitment. But um, this this is about us using the evidence and, and, and doing it. So um, let, let's keep being those role models, going into schools, going into going into communities and, and taking action. Um, I love doing that. As you can tell. Thanks, Jo. Thank you so much. Perfect timing, uh, Libby and James. Thank you so much for both your presentations and some really informative uh, question and answers. Keep the questions coming in on the chat, as we said, that we will be collating uh, some, some answers and we'll send it out after the, the conference early next week. But it's perfect timing for, for a, a comfort break. Uh, we'll be able to see the work uh, in progress from Jules during the break. And we'll see you at 11.15 prompt for the next speaker. Thanks, everybody.
Good morning and welcome back. I hope you've had a, a good comfort break um, and, and welcome to people that, that might be new to uh, the conference, uh, looking at research and retention, um, really about how, how we're supporting our people to stay. We've had two fantastic speakers, uh, Libby and James, this morning that really set the scene so well that are going to feed into the uh, the next uh, set of presentations. Um, James's work is, is available in the chat. It really is a, um, a fantastic read and it's certainly underpinned quite a lot of the work that, that I've undertaken on, on workforce. So thank you for sharing that, James. Um, and just a reminder that for people that are new to the call, um, the, the presentations will be available on the, the university YouTube uh, next week and we'll get that sent out to you. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the next speaker, um, who is Dr. Andrew Weirman. Uh, he's a reader from the University of Bath um, and I know there's some of the team with him um, that um, uh, would be great if they could introduce uh, themselves and the Andrew's research looks at staff experience in the post-COVID world, um, looking at that such situational reality on retention. Um, I'll hand over to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you. Right, well, I'd like to talk you through some findings from a study which we've been doing since winter um, 2020, where we were commissioned to conduct some principally survey, but also some qualitative research, looking at the issue of staff retention, um, really in the, uh, in the midst at that point of the COVID pandemic and looking at its impact in the aftermath. We've had three waves of the survey so far. The fourth wave is currently underway. And what we're gonna to do today is talk, on the, talk you through some of the subset of findings, specifically focused on nurses, and arising from our Wave 3 survey, which is in May 2022. So there are three speakers, between myself, Richard Glendinning and Rachel O'Hara. So we're going to each of us um, present some of this material. So to try and give you an insight into some of the headline findings um, from our work in this area. There's also a published report on headline findings, which will be available, I think, to people at the conference. And I think also Richard's going to put a link to it in the chat shortly. So without further ado, our project then, or our study, if we call it, should I stay or should I go? Um, really looking at this issue of uh, staff retention initially, as I say, looking at the issue of COVID, but obviously as things have moved on and developed, we're looking more at the sort of secondary impacts necessarily rather than the primary impacts. The research set out to address the following aims, really, really to look at how the recovery from the COVID pandemic impacts on staff resources in both the short and longer term what impact the legacy of the crisis will have on the resolve and capacity of current NHS employees to remain in NHS employment, really whether their resolve will be strengthened or weakened by their experience, and critically, which variables predict exit and retention. So in terms of the kinds of themes that we looked at in our survey, we looked at issues to do with recognition of effort, we looked at uh, support for staff, health and well-being, workload, working hours, job satisfaction, or perhaps dissatisfaction more pertinently, sources of worry, reporting of worries to line managers, strength of attachment to the NHS, issues of burnout, redeployment and its impacts, exposure to COVID-19, direct involvement with COVID patients, Staff intentions over the next five years, the vaccination issues, reasons why staff leave or remain, their confidence in the future of the NHS, and also looking at their, what active steps staff might have taken towards leaving. And particularly what we were looking at was sort of patterns, if you like, and we were looking at the precursors, the, the variables which predict exit, and also how patterns of exit might vary across different demographics. So I'm going to pass over to Richard now for the next few slides. Richard. Okay, thanks, Andy. Just give you some brief methodology uh, in terms of how the survey is constructed and how it goes forward. I think a little bit of the slides might be missing at the bottom of the screen, but just running through this, as Andy says, this is uh, an extract from a larger survey we've been doing since 2020, and it focuses on data from 378 registered nurses. So it's part of a wider study of about 1,500 NHS staff members from all settings. 
And that's something we access through the YouGov panel. They've got about a million participants in this country and therefore can target particular groups for large employers like the NHS. So this allows us to control the sample uh, profile on a consistent basis. We can have wave by wave comparisons with some confidence. So the data itself, the collection of the data is controlled by occupational group, but we also make sure it's weighted consistently by key factors around age, ethnicity, and region. So we get a good setting uh, distribution by sectors and by bands and by gender identity. So the sample today we'll be talking about is nurses who are registered nurses only from all settings, from acute, from the community, and from the mental health perspective. Broadly similar views for all those groups. We're talking about general nurses as a whole. We do not include nursing support in this, and we haven't included midwives at this stage in the process because they're relatively small numbers in the sample and we can't pull them out on a consistent basis. So as Andy said, it's a third survey in a series of four. The fourth one is in field at the moment. We'll have the results through for dissemination in late spring, early summer. In terms of the early waves of this, the first two waves were UK-wide. Third wave we're talking about today is England only, only small differences by nation. Our second wave is done a little bit differently, just as a footnote, really. We also carried out parallel studies with 14 participating trusts across England, mental health, community, and acute settings, and with a major trade union. So it generated a very large sample that allowed us to take separate snapshots of particular groups of interest. So it could be early career staff, it might be paramedics, among whom there's serious concerns around retention levels. We could look at mental health nurses and midwives as part of that separate study. And a fourth wave will report, as I say, a bit later in the year. So, Andy, if we just move through some of the initial findings. One of our key measures we've been using all the way through this process is asking people, what has changed recently? So what's got worse? What's got better? What stayed about the same? So this last six-month period at this stage went through to April 22. And you can see on this week some relatively lower level issues that have got worse over that period, but a number of measures that have been identified by most respondents as worsening over that six-month period. So down towards the bottom, we see issues around uh, physical health, around mental health, around resourcing and unpaid overtime, and then larger numbers identifying things getting worse with respect to job enjoyment, satisfaction with standards of care, obviously important in nursing, and then most people feeling that things have worsened in relation to morale, to stress, recognition contribution by government, workload, and staffing levels, with those top two clearly interlinked as well. So that context moves on, Andy, if you could please, to asking people about the main worries and the concerns they've got in relation to their job. So this is a 10-point scale question. If you're not at all concerned with an item, you score one. If you're extremely concerned, you score 10. We treat anything at six and above as being a pretty serious concern at the individual level. So kind of starting from some of the lower level items on this, which are uh, not insignificant concerns, but relatively less significant than some of the ones at the top. Issues around redeployment, that's something which was a big concern in the early stages of our project, but by the third wave, much less of a worry to people. Lack of support from line managers, concerns around PPE, again, a big concern during the early pandemic period less so by the spring of last year. Uh, issues around responsibility, being asked to do work you're not trained to do, significant for quite a few people. Concerns around dealing with a non-COVID treatment backlog. And then worries about physical health, colleagues lacking skills and competencies. And then worries around making mistakes, impact on mental health, quite important for many people. The impact on the excess of removing COVID restrictions. So this question was asked in spring 22, and that's perhaps slightly more of an issue at the time. And the two main concerns coming through at this point around not having enough time to do the job properly and the abnormally high staff shortages. So really very serious level of concern, particularly in relation to workload, time to do the job and staff shortages. So we took, if we move on, Andy, to a number of the key items here and to look at some of the trend data from wave two to wave three. And you can see from most of these variables, you've got a pretty consistent picture. Uh, these are significant concerns. They've been a significant concern for an extended period, and there remain significant concerns. The one notable trend 
we can see there is the rising concerns about high staff shortages and the impact that's got. So a score of nearly seven, up to seven and a half. So we can see a trend of going in the wrong direction, otherwise a pretty consistently concerning picture across all those variables. What we've done with the worry question is follow up by asking people if they raise the issues here with a line manager. So we move on to that, Andy. Anyone who scored at least six on a particular issue, we go on to ask them whether they raised the issue with the line manager and then finding out why they didn't do so. So the data you see in the chart here is all nurses. It's not just those who had a high worry. It's a percentage of all nurses who had both a high worry and did not report those concerns to their line manager. Now, some of those relate to issues around the impact on the NHS removing COVID restrictions, but there are other factors here. So we're talking about a third of nurses not talking to the line manager about major concerns about their mental health and their physical health. And you see a whole range of other issues there. They're not being raised in discussions with line managers on a routine basis. So the issue that follows, and that's we have to find out why that's the case. So <clears throat> for many people, they feel they're in the same boat or they feel that nothing happens when you do raise these issues or line managers are aware of it. Sometimes people feel it's an issue the line managers themselves can't address or they're concerned about the pressure that's going on the line manager as well. But there are significant minorities here who've got concerns around making it look like I can't do my job or being labelled as a troublemaker. So they're not raising these serious level of concerns with a line manager for a wide range of reasons. Andy, if we just move through. Those first items are very much about what's been happening recently. We've also done some future looking as well to try and see how people feel about the next 12 months. So how confident are they on a four point scale from not as all confident to very confident about a range of things happening in the next 12 months? So down towards the bottom, you've got scores in amber and then towards the top scores in red. So the items in amber are where we are saying this is around midpoint on the scale. So people scoring around that level for issues around their own future in the NHS, the vaccination program, seeing the worst of COVID, satisfaction with the standard of care people can deliver. And then you can see the scores going down in, after that point, notably around stress levels improving, the NHS being prepared for further waves of COVID. And in the red territory, that's a score of one or lower. The NHS being able to cope with the demand for non-COVID care staffing levels, daily workload associated with staffing levels as well, and then funding for the NHS. So really quite low levels of confidence in a number of those key items there that you see scored in red. So that looks very much at the wider system looking forward. This is much more about the individual level. So in our third survey, we had a focus on burnout. So this is amongst nurses to ask in the course of the last six months, to what extent have they experienced any of these symptoms? on a frequent basis, that's most days or every day. So towards half of all nurses in the survey reported feeling very tired or drained on an almost daily basis. So really high and very concerning figure, low energy also being picked up by more than a third of respondents, physical exhaustion scoring highly, concerns around mental exhaustion, negative feelings, overwhelmed, and so on down the list. But really strikingly high levels of burnout amongst the nursing workforce. And most members of staff on the nursing side felt this was driven primarily by their work in the NHS. Andy, back to you. Thanks, Richard. Right. So turning then to issues about reasons why people stay and reason why they leave NHS employment. Now, in many respects, uh, COVID variables accepted. Um, we know quite a lot about this historically, about the kinds of reasons. The issues relates more to their prevalence, if you like. So what we were interested to do is to look at the variables in the box on the right-hand side there, so things like pensions, pay, job security, commitment to the NHS, and so on. These can be construed as a set of push and pull influences, if you like, variables which encourage people to stay or, or encourage people to leave the organisations. So what we did was to present respondents with a list of widely recognised influences on reasons to stay and reasons to leave, and then 
The purpose of this being really to try and determine the relative strength of these variables. So which variables are more important? Now, clearly knowing which variables are more important is key to thinking about priorities for intervention and also looking across to see whether this varies demographically um, across different segments of the, of, uh, the nursing workforce. So what we've got here is, or what's going to follow is an output which relates to the ranking of the relative importance of these push and pull influences. So the leave and remain influences, if you like. So if you look at the reasons when we ask people about why do people stay working in the NHS, the ranking comes out as follows. So issues to do with job satisfaction and making a difference. So intrinsic job satisfaction, if you like, those kind of variables are very much at the top of the list there. Now, I think that's important because we're going to see further on that there does appear to have been some attrition in that respect, uh, significant evidence of frustration among staff in not being able to provide the standard of care, so probable implications for their intrinsic job satisfaction, which we think is important. Job security is always all there as well, NHS pensions and so on. Equally, issues to do with um, career and training and promotion opportunities, and so on. But the important issue here is the fact we've got a ranking of the relative importance of these variables. So the suggestion being that issues to do with the, the upper end of that ranking are probably a bigger impact on the reasons why staff stay. But it is important to keep in mind that what we've got here is a, a ranking of important reasons. So, so what that doesn't suggest or would be inappropriate to conclude is that issues at the bottom of the ranking are unimportant, but the issue remains that possibly attention to those variables alone probably may, may not make a big enough difference is our suggestion here. Yeah. If we look at the data over the waves two and wave three, so we look at the data from, um, from around last May and the previous six months, then most of the variables are fairly stable, but the one variable that does stand out is this issue of job satisfaction from the care of the patients, which does appear to have dropped by some percentage points. So that suggests that there's been some attrition there, that there are issues and it seems to be backed up by some of our qualitative evidence that there is significant um, dissatisfaction and frustration over people feeling that they don't feel able to provide the level of care that they would choose to. So I think that's a variable which is probably of significant importance. Moving on to the issue about why do people leave? Again, we've got a different ranking here. Top of the ranking there is issues to do with stress. Um, probably no great surprise to many, shortage of staff resources. And again, ability to provide good pay for patients or lack of ability or frustrations in that area. Pay at the point of uh, gathering this data came out as fourth on the list. It's quite possible that we might find uh, the pay is further up the list uh, in the next uh, wave of the survey. Having said that, while pay is clearly important to staff, most of the evidence we've had over the, over the years has suggested that pay is very much in the mix, but it maybe doesn't appear to or doesn't present as being sufficient in itself to resolve the issue. Something else which is perhaps interesting here is the, the issue to do with the flexibility of part, um, uh, hours and availability of part-time working, flexible working arrangements. Now, again, as I say, this is a ranking of important variables, but it does come back quite a long way down the list there. It does rather suggest that there are other issues more to do with the, uh, the workload and what's and working hours and so forth in terms of the, the amount of intensity of work um, comes further up the list. So again, not suggesting these variables are unimportant, but it does suggest that attention to those areas at the bottom of the list alone possibly won't have enough of an impact. Conclusion. If we look at the change over time, again, we find that um, most of the variables are fairly stable. We do see some kind of uh, improvement, it seems, in support from managers. There's an improvement um, from 59 at wave 2%, to dropping down to 51 So that shows some kind of improvement in the right kind of direction. But the overall picture is very much one of stability here. And what this seems to imply is that it would be unreasonable to view the COVID pandemic as a, a speed hump effect, if you like, and that these variables seem to be enduring. So they don't appear to be just a product of the pandemic and its immediate consequences, but in big persisting. Rachel, would you like to talk us through some of the uh, qualitative insights? Okay. 
So survey respondents were asked to give reasons for significant changes to ratings for why nurses leave the NHS. And the comments here illustrate key reasons. And they're consistent with earlier interviews we conducted with nurses from acute community and mental health trusts. So a key issue, as we've already heard, is the impact of increasingly insufficient staff resources to meet work demands, uh, which has contributed to poor mental health and burnout both through and beyond the COVID pandemic. So this is perceived as a long-term problem for the NHS and even um, managers that are considered to be supportive are regarded as unable to make a significant difference to working conditions for staff. Uh, more recently, and with the increased cost of living, nurses have identified the potential for better pay outside the NHS as a consideration with a comment here that working in a supermarket would pay better. Okay, I'll hand back to you, Andy. Thank you. Yes, but just to emphasise really the importance we feel of a, of a combined method study like this, where you've got quantitative evidence which tells you who, what, how much issues, if you like, but the qualitative insights that we've got from interviews with staff tell us quite a lot more about why these variables are important which is, we believe to be key to understanding or thinking about and informing decisions over what kind of resolution, what kind of intervention might uh, prove to be effective. One of the other things we tried to address was the issue about um, staff's future um, intentions in terms of leaving the organisation. And one of the methodological um, sort of challenges here is if you ask people about the future and what they plan to do in the future, um, that kind of output tends to be uh, of questionable reliability in the sense that quite often our aspirations are not met, the practicalities kick in, and we don't necessarily uh, follow through with our intentions. So we tried to address that by uh, adopting an approach which was much more behaviourally based. We asked people about what steps they'd taken in the previous six months towards uh, seeking out alternative employment. So we're trying to actually look more at a more behavioural based measure of this. and. What we sort of what we found was that if we asked people about um, whether they talked to colleagues about job opportunities outside the NHS, we asked them if they'd actually gone as far as looking at vacancy lists for jobs outside the NHS. Have they requested details? Have they actually submitted an application? Have they been interviewed? And equally, have they been offered a job which included unsolicited offers of jobs? from non-NHS organisations. And our focus here was very much upon those individuals leaving the NHS rather than um, people internal moves, if you like, which would be effectively no net loss to the NHS as a whole. So you can see a profile here. The important issue for us, we believe, is this issue about going as far as actually submitting an application for a job, which we would suggest is a, uh, you know, clearly an active step towards exit. And what we find here is that about about 10% of nurses are actually reporting having completed and not at least one or possibly more non-NHS job applications in the previous six months. And again, looking at the wave two and wave three findings we've got here, we can see that there appears to be some, well, broadly speaking, stability, possibly some kind of uh, broad uh, rise, if anything, across the board in sort of people taking an interest. But broadly speaking, the figures are fairly similar but it also suggests ultimately that the rates haven't, certainly haven't gone down. So we think that around one in 10 for nurses, it's actually higher for some other groups. And we also found that it's higher for some groups, um, particularly the redeployed, um, exhibit higher rates of uh, applying for non-NHS jobs um, than other groups. So it's possible to look at different segments in that respect. We also asked people about where they would like to be. So this was a more aspirational question about where they would like to be in five years' time. The results for which, again, there's quite a lot of stability over the two waves here, around about 45 to 50% of thereabouts uh, saw themselves as continuing working in the NHS. Around 20% saw themselves as retired and around 5% saw themselves working out in the private sector healthcare or working outside the NHS, outside the healthcare sector. So a significant numbers then view themselves as being elsewhere effectively, either due to retirement or alternative employment in five years' time. So there certainly seems to be significant aspiration there. And again, the, the data seems to be fairly stable. It doesn't seem to have gone down as the pandemic has matured. 
We also asked our respondents about whether they would recommend working for the NHS to others. Around about 41% um, of nurses replied positively to this question. Now that compares with actually 51% for all NHS staff, so slightly lower percentage or significant 10 percentage points lower of nursing staff would recommend working for the NHS to others. Now if we look back at wave two compared with wave three, we actually find that the profile doesn't look particularly positive in the sense that a fewer proportion now of wave or the most recent data um, are reporting that they would recommend working for the NHS for others than they were at wave two. Obviously, wave four will have give us more insight as to whether that's a trend or whether that appears to be some kind of uh, uh, sort of just noise in the data. So in terms of our headline findings, we'd say that the vulnerabilities are the kind of the variables which uh, uh, potentially induce people to um, cease their employment in the NHS. The incubating threats, if you like, at wave three of our survey mirror those at wave two. Either there's, either there's been no substantive attenuation or change over that period. One in two staff rated morale, stress, recognition by government and workload as worse than six months previously. In terms of the top three worries and concerns for nurses, issues of staff shortages, insufficient time to do the job properly, and removal of COVID restrictions were the, the principal variables, as I say, back last May. It may be well be that the, the third one of those may well change at the fourth wave, but at wave last May, that was certainly the third highest worry. If you look at the top five reasons why nurses leave, work-related stress, staff shortages, barriers to providing good patient care, pay and impacts on mental health represent the top three variables. In terms of the reasons why nurses stay, well, the sort of issues that you might want to try and uh, amplify in, um, in terms of um, and uh, propagate, job satisfaction for caring for patients was number one, to make a difference again in terms of patient care, number two, job security, number three, and pensions, number four. Around two-fifths appeared to aspire to leave the NHS within the next five years or so, around one in four of those related to retirement. And one of the issues and one of the pro issues we know about um, nurses in the NHS is it's a relatively old population. There is the, the distribution of nurses is skewed. A high proportion of nursing staff are in, that, in the periods of entering in their 50s or certainly in their late 40s. And we also know that it's high proportion of staff tend to leave starting from age 50 to 55 onwards. So unless we can actually arrest that, that in itself is going to be problematic as the average age rises. We send a downward trend in the percentage of staff we recommend working to the NHS for others. We also see very low confidence in the future, which is perturbing regarding particularly the sufficiency of funding, staff, the staffing levels will improve, the workloads will go down, the capacity to cope with the treatments backlog is sufficient. And over one in three staff or nursing staff are reporting low energy and around one in two suggesting that they're tired or drained on most or every day. So there seems to be strong evidence of, of burnout. So in many respects, I think that, you know, probably a lot of our findings here aren't necessarily particularly surprising, but it does put, allow us to have an indication of the, of the data and the indication of trend over time. We can see how much change is occurring over time and whether these variables are improving or not. And this, uh, to date, many of those variables appear to be not necessarily improving, and some of them could be getting worse over the last two years or so. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, um, colleagues. Um, you've raised hundreds of questions um, in my head, head, and I'm sure you have um, with loads of colleagues that are on the call. Um, so can I encourage um, people to put any questions that they've got for um, the team into the Q&A and uh, Andrew, Richard, uh, hopefully you'll be able to stop with us for the, the Q&A session um, a little bit later on and we can pick up some of those questions um, with you. So thank you for that absolutely fantastic and um, really interesting um, presentation. So um, 
recognizing that we're kind of getting challenged for time i'm going to hand us straight over um to max warner who's a research economist for the institute of fiscal studies um and um he's going to max is going to talk to us about some of the factors associated um with the retention uh in the acute sector so over to you max thank you thank you victoria okay yeah so as Victoria says, um, I, my name is Max Warner from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, um, and I'm going to present work that we've published actually last year now, um, and the link to that publication will be made available, um, looking at the factors associated with staff retention in the NHS acute sector. This is work joint with my colleagues at the IFS, Elaine Kelly and George Stoy. So really the research question, as it says on the tin, is what factors are associated with staff leaving the NHS acute sector? And we're gonna take a kind of complementary approach to what you saw in our last presentation. And instead of using survey data, we're gonna use administrative data. And in particular, we're gonna use the electronic staff record, which is the monthly payroll of all staff directly employed by the NHS. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna examine the association between whether an individual staff member actually leaves the acute sector, so not looking at intention, but actually leaving, with a range of individual, regional and trust characteristics. Today I'm really going to focus in on nurses and midwives and healthcare assistants, but we have looked at, for example, consultants, and that's available in the full report. And just as a bit of background, this work was commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Care via the PRU in Health and Social Care Workforce that we at IFS are a part of and features very useful input from teams at DH, NHSE and Health Education England. So, as I said at the beginning, the really key thing is we're going to look at whether an individual leaves the NHS acute sector. That's going to include those leaving the NHS entirely. So, for example, moving from the NHS to another sector of the economy. It's also going to include those moving to another sector within the NHS. So, for example, moving from the acute sector to mental health, for example. What it's going to exclude is those moving between acute trusts. It's also going to exclude things like paid maternity leave, as ultimately these people are still working within the acute sector. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the association between a range of different factors and the probability that an individual leaves. And crucially, we're going to do this together. So we're going to look at the effect or the association of each factor, holding all other factors constant. So, for example, when we look at differences by nationality, that's going to be comparing staff with the same age, the same gender, the same other characteristics, but who differ on nationality. And we're going to do that for all of our different factors. Now, as we're going to see, lots of things clearly matter for retention. And lots of these things are actually quite hard to measure. If we think about things in the previous presentation, lots of those are not easy to measure kind of administratively. So what we're going to do is we're going to also control for persistent differences in leaving rates between trusts and over time that you can really think of as kind of unexplained, at least unexplained in terms of the data, consistent differences in leaving rates. Um, that will become clear as we get to it. We're going to estimate this separately for each staff group and our sample period is really going to be the last decade. So between April 2012 and August 2021. So really here we're trying to get a long run look at retention factors over the last 10 years. We're not going to particularly focus on COVID. That will, of course, have created new pressures, but really we want to get the kind of the underlying factors. OK, and now actually going on to these factors, the first thing we're going to look at are individual characteristics. These include demographics, so age, tenure, gender, nationality group. They also include sickness absence. And in particular, we're going to look at the association between leaving and physical health related absences and mental health related absences of staff. We're also going to look at a number of local economic conditions and a range of trust characteristics that might plausibly be associated with retention. Things like operational performance, leaving rates, negative reasons for leaving, things to do with the staff survey. Um, and crucially, we're going to lag most of these factors by three months. So we're going to look at the association between whether you leave now and what was happening three months ago. That's just to reflect the time it takes people to actually decide to leave the sector. OK, and the final kind of word of caution is how we should think about these associations. And something that's really important to take away when you're looking at these results is that the estimated effects or associations are crucially associations. They're not causal 
So, for example, we're going to find that trusts with a higher staff engagement have lower leaving rates for nurses. Now, that could be a true causal relationship. It could be higher staff engagement causes lower leaving rates. It could be reverse causality. It could be in trust where fewer people leave, there's higher staff engagement, or it could be a common third factor. So it could be trust that has really good management and culture simultaneously have higher staff engagement and lower leading rates. So it's really important that these are not necessarily causal relationships, they're just associations, but they're still really useful for prediction. And in particular, highlighting at risk groups. So which groups of nurses, which groups of healthcare assistants are most at risk of leaving the NHS? Where should we maybe prioritize limited resources? They're also going to be useful for guiding future causal research. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how each individual factor is associated and changes the estimated probability of leaving the acute sector. And we're going to really look at that relative to the average leaving rates. And in particular, in our sample and by our definitions, on average, about 0.8% of nurses and midwives leave the NHS each month. That's about double the rate for consultants. And for healthcare assistants, it's about 50% more. So on average, about 1.2% of the workforce leave per month. OK. Before we get into the details, I'm just going to summarise some of the key findings. So firstly, unsurprisingly, we're going to find that individual demographics are very strongly associated with leaving decisions. But crucially, there are really quite different patterns for different staff groups, really emphasising that we can't just take a one size fits all approach to understanding what's going on with retention. We're also going to find that sickness absences are strongly associated with leaving particularly mental health related absences. So higher physical health related absences are going to increase the probability of leaving, but mental health is going to have about double the effect of physical health. We're also going to see that some trust and regional characteristics are associated with leaving decisions, but actually many of them are not. And I think a really important thing to take away when we think about, you know, where's the state of research and retention is actually much of what determines leaving rates remains unexplained, both by the factors we consider and lots of more broad evidence. And particularly, we're going to find that there are these really large, persistent differences in leaving rates between different trusts that are not explained by the factors we consider. So you can kind of think of these as unexplained differences in retention, maybe coming from culture, maybe coming from other things that are hard to measure. But crucially, we're going to see that these differences are really not that strongly correlated between staff groups within the same trust, suggesting really it's different unobserved persistent factors that matter for different staff groups. OK, I'm now going to take us in directly to some of the key results. And we're first going to look at how the probability of leaving the NHS differs by age. And we're going to split this by gender. So we're first going to look for female staff and then for male staff. And what we're going to do is we're going to show how the probability of leaving the acute sector, conditional on all these other characteristics, varies relative to those aged 40 to 44. So in yellow, you can see what it looks like for female nurses and midwives. And really, you can see it kind of peaks the nurses and midwives in their early 30s and then fall slightly with the lowest leaving rates those in their mid late 40s early 50s and in their late 60s so really when we think about female nurses those at highest risk of leaving are those in their early 30s that is part linked to maternity behavior and actually those with the lowing leaving rate lowest leaving rates i should say are those in their late 40s and early 50s if we look at female HCAs, we see a somewhat sim different pattern. Well, somewhat similar, somewhat different. We see, again, leaving rates peak for female HCAs in their early 30s and are relatively high in their mid 30s, too. But we actually see leaving rates for very young female HCAs are relatively low, as are those who are older, towards 65 plus. We can then repeat this analysis for male staff, and I think. It's immediately apparent that the age profiles are very different from male and female staff. So here we're looking at male nurses and you can see the probability of leaving the acute sector is really relatively flat over most of the life. It only really starts to rise for male nurses in their 50s and 60s. Remember how different that is for female nurses where it really is kind of spiking in early mid 30s. 
If we look at male HCAs, we see a similar pattern at the end, again, rising rapidly with age. But actually, we see that young male HCAs are very likely to leave. And if you remember the previous slide, we actually saw that young female HCAs were relatively unlikely to leave. So again, a really big gender difference. And I think it's really striking in both cases that you know male HCAs and male nurses midwives look very similar compared to female nurses midwives and female HCAs. It's really quite big gender differences here. We also look at a range of other demographics. So these profiles that we saw before were the effect of age. But really, we can also look at gender itself. And we see that female nurses and midwives are about 7% less likely to leave. But there's actually no gender difference for healthcare systems. We've also looked at nationality groups. And so relative to British staff, EU nurses and midwives, this column here, are about 43% more likely to leave in a given month than the equivalent British staff of the same age, the same gender, et cetera, et cetera. However, non-EU nurses and midwives are actually less likely. So we kind of have this ordering of EU nurses and midwives most likely, then it's British, then it's non-EU. There's maybe a potentially obvious explanation for that, but actually this gap existed prior to 2016, though the gap between EU and British has increased since then. It was still existing before that. If we look at HCAs, we see actually a bit of a different pattern. Both EU and non-EU HCAs are less likely to leave than British staff. So really, it's British HCAs are the most likely to leave, followed by EU and then non-EU. OK, and the final thing I want to look at with individual characteristics is sickness absences. So here we look at what's the association between leaving now in a given month with sickness absences three months ago. And the key takeaway is that both are very positively associated. So for nurses and midwives, missing three days of work for physical health related absences is associated with about 13 percent higher probability of leaving. So that's quite a big change, given it's only three days of absences. But we actually see even larger effects in mental health related absences. So for a nurse and midwife, missing three days of work for mental health related reasons is associated with a 27 percent higher probability of subsequently leaving the acute sector three months later. So really sickness absences come out at an individual level as a quite strong predictor of whether staff are going to leave the acute sector. As I mentioned at the introduction, we've also examined a range of trust and regional characteristics. I'm not going to focus on these too much, but we find, for example, higher regional unemployment rates are associated with a lower probability of leaving and nurses, particularly actually band five nurses and midwives and healthcare systems. That's consistent with what you'd expect as a kind of measure of outside labour market opportunities. We also find results related to staff engagement, but again, it's important to emphasise these are not causal, so I'm not going to really focus on these given the time constraints we have today. What I really want to do is talk a little bit bigger picture about what we know and what we don't know about retention in my final couple of minutes. So crucially, despite looking at a lot of different relevant factors, most of the variation in leaving rates remains unexplained, even after we account for kind of persistent differences between trusts and over time. So, for example, if we look at monthly trust leaving rates, all of these things put in together only explain about 21 percent of variation in nurses and midwives and about 15 percent for healthcare systems. So, Taken at face value, there's a lot we still don't know, actually, about what determines retention decisions, both at an individual level, but also even at a trust level. And that brings me quite nicely into thinking a little bit more about persistent differences between trusts. So our methodology looks at the associations between lots of factors and whether individual staff members leave the acute sector. We also estimate persistent differences in leaving rates between trusts that cannot be explained by our other factors. And here you should really think of these kind of unexplained differences in retention. So they're not explained by demographics, sickness, measures of trust performance, things like that. They're driven by things we can't easily measure, for example, management quality, local area amenities, local labour markets. And although we can't measure what's actually going into them, we can still take these persistent differences to try and understand what could be driving them. And the first thing we can do is say, OK, what's the unexplained variation? What's the unexplained leaving rate for nurses? What's it for healthcare assistants? Can we compare that at individual trusts? 
And when you do that, we can do that for doctors too, you actually find that they're very uncorrelated. And what that really means is different persistent factors matter for different staff groups. That might sound obvious, but I think it's actually quite an interesting result. It's not just that one trust that does really well retaining its nurses also does really well retaining its doctors or healthcare assistants. Actually, on average, trusts that do very well for one group are doing just average for other groups. So thinking about which are good trusts for retention, what kind of things can we implement at the trust level to improve retention, really need to be thought about targeting specific staff groups. This evidence here, at least, would suggest that there's not a kind of one size fits all approach that will benefit all staff groups immediately. The final thing I want to show you is just how these kind of unexplained differences in leaving rates differ by region. So just to emphasize, this is not the average leaving rate per region. This is the average leaving rate per region that cannot be explained by our factors. So kind of unexplained or unexpected leaving rates. In yellow, I have four nurses and midwives. And you can see that actually nurses and midwives working in the southeast of Greater London to the right have higher leaving rates than we'd expect, given, for example, the demographics of their staff, while trusts, particularly in the northeast, but also in the northwest, Yorkshire and the West Midlands, have lower leaving rates than we might expect. Suggesting, again, if we need to focus that actually in the southeast and greater London, there's relatively higher problem with staff retention. We can do the same in blue for healthcare assistance. You see that in general, it's quite similar, but there are some differences. And again, that just reiterates the kind of differences by staff groups. So, for example, in Yorkshire, relatively good, relatively low leaving rates for nurses, midwives, relatively high for healthcare assistants. OK, so just to conclude, a bit of a whistle stop tour um, of some of our work. We've shown that individual demographics and particularly sickness absences are really strongly associated with individual leaving decisions and therefore really good at understanding at which groups. But there are really quite big differences by staff groups. Some trust and regional characteristics are associated with leaving decisions in our analysis. Things like unemployment rates, staff engagement, many of them are not. And crucially, much of what determines leaving rates and leaving decisions at an individual level actually remains unknown. Um, and we've got upcoming work, for example, to think about the role of outside options for lower paid staff. And also, look, thinking about things that we saw in the previous presentation, quantifying the role of line managers um, for leaving decisions, which with new data we're going to be able to do. But a, kind, a really important final takeaway, for me at least, is these large persistent differences between trusts. Some trusts just have much better retention than other trusts in ways that, at least to an outside researcher, are hard to explain. And a lot more work is needed to understand what drives these differences. But crucially, they're quite different for different staff groups, suggesting that different persistent factors matter for these different groups. OK, that is everything from me. Thank you very much. I will hand back over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max, for that presentation. Absolutely fascinating how it varies across different staff groups, different regions. Um, so please, I'm sure that that's uh, prompted some questions from people. So please put the questions in, in uh, the question and answer box and we'll come back to Max um, uh, later on. Thank you so much. So without further ado, I want to hand you over to, to Charlene Presley. Uh, Charlene is a, a retention manager for not, uh, NHS England, also a clinical senior clinical academic here at the University of Huddersfield. Um, and Charlene is presenting her research on safeguarding nurse retention, looking at why nurses stay. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Joanne. Um, we'd like to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking with you about why nurses stay and what the evidence suggests we can do to safeguard and protect nurse retention. So very much looking into some of the unexplained um factors that, that Max just spoke about then. So, so this study, um, the, a systematic review on the determinants of a nurse's intention to stay was undertaken by Professor Joanne Garside and myself in 2021 and published in 2022. 
As we know, as, as many of the speakers have spoke to this morning, there is a global shortage of nursing and this demand for nurses is putting a demand on nurses by increasing workloads and pressures in that for every nurse that leaves, there is a detrimental impact on the working experiences of nurses who remain. Worryingly, the forecast is that this position will deteriorate further and by the year 2030, it is predicted there will be a worldwide deficit that surpasses 9 million nurses. Recruitment alone is not the solution. And even if there are, and even if this was the case, there is insufficient replenishing stocks to fill existing vacancies and replace nurses that continue to leave. This is a challenge that can only be addressed in, in harmony with retention, hence the urgency to understand how to safeguard and protect nurses already working within our systems to stay. So when we consider the subject of retention, historically the fulcrum of inquiry into workforce shortages has explored why nurses leave and indeed much of the data that we've heard from this morning and that we capture within the NHS is reasons for leaving. Much is known about these reg regressive lag indicators and corrosive factors that cause a nurse's intention to leave and yet there is limited insight into the forward-looking solutions focused indicators of why nurses stay. As we know the reasons why nurses stay and the reasons why nurses leave are different. Therefore whilst ever the factors of why nurses stay remain undetermined there is a gap in understanding a seemingly missed opportunity in the face of the reality of the brittle global nursing workforce position and the reason why we undertook this research. So let's begin by looking at the details of our review. The aim of our review was to systematically explore the factors that influence retention nurses' intention to stay working. And to achieve this aim, we devised three objectives. We wanted to look at components that impact nurses' experience of work. We wanted to understand the motivations and challenges of nurses' intention to stay. And finally, we wanted to develop a solutions-focused retention framework. So a little bit about the design of our review. So the design is a systematic review and narrative synthesis. There are many small sample, single site, low quality published studies and we wanted to produce the exact opposite through this study in that we wanted to synthesise a high quality, reliable, replicable and rigorous study. Now due to heterogeneity um, and the inability as Max described to predict causality, a meta-analysis could not be utilised um, so we applied a narrative synthesis without meta-analysis approach um, and, and just to say that this review was then used to be the um, systematic review that underpinned the nursing and midwifery self-assessment tool um, which, is, which is brilliant and so I wanted a really quality, uh, really high quality study. So 34 studies were included in the review. Um, however, before we go on to discuss the results in more detail, I wanted to state our working definition of intention to stay, as there are different descriptions of this. So intention to, to stay is described as the nurse's perceptions of their likelihood of staying in their current job or the stated probability of them staying with the current organisation which we suggest means a nurse's intention to stay working in the profession per se. And we found two principal determinants of intention to stay, and they were job satisfaction and or organisational commitment. So to consider these in more detail, job satisfaction occurs when an individual feels that their needs are being met, when they remain motivated and are able to overcome challenges of employment. Many factors influence job satisfaction and these are listed in the blue boxes. These factors contribute to the feeling of fulfillment and or enjoyment of a nurse's experience when satisfied at work. So 
So when we look at the the components of what is organisational commitment, organisational commitment has a nuanced relationship with intention to stay in that it stands alone as a reason why nurses stay and it is also correlated to job satisfaction. Organisational commitment comprises of three things. First is the satisfaction. So you so you can, nurses are committed to an organisation if they are satisfied, as in they enjoy their job and wouldn't want to work elsewhere. A second reason for organisational commitment is if a nurse feels duty bound or obliged to a role or team. And then the third reason for organisational commitment is if a nurse feels stuck, as in if they're unable to find the same terms and conditions elsewhere. And we found from our research that organisational commitment acts as a stabiliser, which positively reinforces behavioural intention to stay. So looking further into the research, job satisfaction and an organisational commitment that influence intention to stay can be organised into three groups. And those are environmental factors, relational factors, and individual factors. So let's look at these individual subgroups in greater detail. Environmental factors that comprise organisational culture is a complex dynamic system that influences job satisfaction, organisational commitment and intention to stay. And there are eight identified factors within this environmental group. When we think about environmental factors in relation to intention to stay, we consider things such as how busy the job is and the workload, the speciality and the acuity of the people we care for. If nurses feel comfortable to raise concerns, should they have them? How pressurised the environment is to work in, the level of support they are getting from employers, to do a job to a standard that they feel pride of, if they feel supported to have work lifestyle balance that fits with their needs and if they feel they can develop to reach their full potential working in this area. And these things very much talk to what Mark, Max was um, speaking about, about the unexplained and how these are difficult to measure. But actually, when we can see them as clearly as this, we can really start to understand why nurses stay, the environmental factors that support nurses to stay. So the next subgroup is relational factors, which are professional dynamics. And there are seven relational factors within the dynamics of professional relationships. And these are listed in the blue boxes. And what we find is that professional relationships are a significant contributing factor to a nurse's intention to stay. Teamwork is positively linked with a nurse feeling safer at work and with increased job satisfaction. Studies found that nurses that have friends at work were much more likely to stay and where work had an element of fun. We found that transformational and relational leadership is recognised to positively influence culture, promote job embeddedness, positively impact on work environments, reduce burnout and promote empowerment. So all the things that the University of Bath spoke about this morning. Our research found that leaders regulate the barometer of personal and professional psychological safety and support. This subgroup determines that connectivity through the relationships that we have at work is a significant factor of retention. The next subcategory is that of individual factors. So these are the psychosocial, emotional and professional factors. So this subgroup identified 10 factors that support an individual with their ability to manage their experience at work. And these are listed in the blue boxes. Again, with this, this category, we found that because nursing is not only a physically demanding job and the ethical nature of working in an emotionally labour intensive environment and working in a caring profession means the work is more complex 
and we, nurses must be able to positively navigate these individual factors if they are to stay. So in summary of the three overarching groups, environmental, relational and individual, These key findings indicate that nurses stay when workplace cultures and conditions meet personal and professional need, when relationships at work are supportive, trusting, enable them to feel safe, and when nurses are more likely to stay if they are motivated to remain engaged and if they feel connected and when they can master the challenges they face. Intrinsically, nurses stay when they perceive they can manage their personal stress and the emotional burdens contingent of caring for others. If they are able to work autonomously and feel in control of their workloads and empowered, and nurses stay when they can provide care corresponding with their professional values, which gives them meaning and purpose, and when they have opportunities to personally and professionally grow. So we describe these 25 factors that correlate with intention to stay as protective factors. These factors are the salient antecedent pull factors that contribute to job satisfaction and or organisational commitment that safeguard nurse retention and intention to stay. Whilst the focus of the review was to understand why registered nurses stay working in the health and social care sector, an incidental yet remarkable finding suggested that these protective factors are noticeably weighted by age and career tenure, as in younger nurses who have often worked lesser years in employment have lower intention to stay working compared with their older counterparts. And indeed, the factors that protect and safeguard nurses to stay are prioritised differently for younger with lesser years of experience than those of older nurses. So again, our findings reinforce Max's findings from the IFS. So into a table, here are the 25 findings of the protective factors mapped into an intention to stay framework. As highlighted, the needs differ by age and career stage, and therefore the things that safeguard and protect them to stay are weighted differently. So as we move into the so what factor, so how can we take the findings from this research and really translate them into to changing state and supporting stay behaviours? This intention to stay radar chart framework, it can be used both diagnostically and prescriptively, as in we can use it diagnostically to explore why nurses may not be staying and then prescriptively to examine what maybe we need to focus a little bit in more detail on to support nurses to stay. And on the outside of the radar chart, we can see the protective factors. And we can indeed invite employees or leaders or teams to explore the elements um, and use it to um, map where they feel they are um, in regards to intention to stay factors. So let's look at the framework in the context of early career nurses firstly because as we found that this is a particular vulnerable cohort for retention. Now, we know that from our research, um, early career nurses have different experiences of work, as in they have greater expectations from employers, but lower levels of organisational commitments. Findings, as, as described in other research this morning, explain how early career nurses may readily job hop to find better environments. Um, finding sure they have higher levels of stress and high, lower levels of resilience and lesser job control um, finding sure that they have higher levels of, of moral distress and yet lower levels of job embeddedness and belonging so these experience if we consider these in the context of other speakers this morning start to really say well what can we do to support these nurses to stay and we can see the list of priorities there 
um, below. So if we know what the risk factors are and we know what their priorities are, we can start to really use the intention to stay in framework to start to think about what our plans are and where we're going to focus our retention priority to support. Similarly, with later career nurses, their personal profile is different um, and their priorities change across the, the course of a career, as shown to change across the course of a career. Um, we find that they have um, higher levels of job embeddedness and job control, a lower need for belonging and support to manage moral distress. Again, um, a strong argument is made that this might be a result of them um, working longer in the profession and therefore they too needed the support that early career nurses may need when starting out. However, on successful receipt of this, this enabled them to stay working longer in the profession. That said, the evidence suggests that while some things are needed lesser of in later career, because priorities are known to change across the course for a career, some factors become markedly more important and priorities change as we progress through a career. We see how in later career autonomy is a priority and that later career nurses will stay working longer for leaders that they feel value their skills and expertise. Meeting these needs could support later career nurses to have longer careers. When we consider all career nurses, we find stark findings how more unites nurses that divides them in the profession. However, because nurses' experience and priorities differ by age and career stage, it may, that we take, it may be that we take a different focus strategy in how to support nurses to stay. Interestingly, flexible working with equal priority across all stages of career, and we see that coming through in one of the key high impact interventions coming through for NHS England at the moment. So just to bring things into summary, all nurses want to work in po productive, positive environments and have supportive relationships at work and have in the individual factors necessary to thrive. This research determines that protective factors that safeguard nurses stay. It explains what contributes to job satisfaction and organisational commitment and offers a framework to both diagnose and prescribe how to improve nurse retention. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that presentation, uh, Charlene. I know I know the research, but um, every time you present it, I think it, it really puts uh, that detail uh, that supports the, the figures that, that we're seeing from other presenters. So thank you for that. Again, keep the questions coming in um, and, and we'll have an opportunity to ask Charlene uh, any related to that presentation. Um, and then without further ado, I want to invite Zoe. Zoe Evans is Head of Staff Experience and Engagement at NHS England and she's presenting Understanding Employees' Engagement and Why It's Important to Patient, Individual and Organisational Outcomes. Thank you, Zoe. Hi, thanks, Joanne. And thanks so much today for, for you and Victoria inviting me to uh, join this session today. And um, wow, I think we've just had a really full uh, load of information and insight that's been provided um, already. What I will try and do now is share my screen. So as uh, um, I was saying, my name is Zoe Evans. I'm head of the staff engagement team in the People Director at NHS England. Um, and this session will kind of give you a bit of an insight to academic research and theoretical understanding of the construct of employee engagement and how there's been some confusion when that's met kind of human resource management, how we've unpicked that within the NHS, why it's important and what it means to us in terms of organisational, individual and most imp importantly, patient outcomes. So it's going to be a pretty uh, tight whistle stop tour. There's so much information that we could uh, talk about in this area and certainly build on a lot of the information that you heard from Charlene and from Max earlier in terms of uh, causal links not being completely identified, but certainly looking at where there's positive relationships. 
So firstly, it's important that uh, we look at what employee engagement isn't. Um, I'm sure when we say the term to everybody, we say, what does employee engagement mean to you? And we'll probably get 51 separate definitions back. And that's certainly what was found when some research was done uh, by the government back in 2009 by uh, Nita Clark and David McLeod, um, that everybody was kind of trying to define it differently. But it has um, actually been defined as a construct in its own right. Um, it's not what often people think about as um, communications or more generally the openness of communication channels between management staff in organisation. It goes much further than that. So back in 2002, Scorfelli actually defined it with the three principles that you can see on the slide there. The psychological engagement, the dimensions of dedication, vigour and absorption, the idea of influence in wider decision making and the concept of advocacy, which we've heard a few times now now, um, throughout the presentations this morning, the extent to which employees would recommend their organisation either as a place to work or to receive treatment, really important concepts. So, being really clear on how we measure employee engagement in the NHS, there are nine questions that are used. These are used in the annual NHS staff survey. The staff survey being a gold mine and treasure trove of information around employee experience. Uh, it's been running now for nearly two decades um, and has now historical and longitudinal analysis. The uh, engagement theme itself was introduced back in 2017. So we've got a, a lot of trend data that we can look at. We, we try to understand the importance of employee engagement. In terms of the, the last response rate that we had, we had nearly um, 640,000 colleagues respond to the annual staff survey. And you can cut the staff survey by all of the different groups that have been mentioned today, which is why it's really important to be able to get that really individual view. So you can cut at a local level by team. You can cut by directorate, you can cut by organisational type, you can cut by region, ICS and national, and then all of the demographics within that by occupational group, by protected characteristic and so forth. So again, it's done to an official statistic, so it's got real robust and integrity aligned to it, and it's all publicly available. So if you don't know where to go and find that, let me know and I can make sure we put that information in the chat box for you later. So you can see there on the left hand side, the three sub themes that make up employee engagement theme itself, and that's motivation, involvement and advocacy. So why is it so important? So employee engagement, and again, we're not defining the causal link, uh, building on what Max said earlier, what we're showing is there's a positive uh, relationship between employee engagement and different outcomes that have been measured in uh, NHS organisations green boxes, those that have positive associations with employee engagement, and that goes to mortality and health outcomes, enhanced patient satisfaction rates, patient safety, and again, that links down to the box at the bottom. So, you can see a really strong correlation between NHS staff engagement theme and National Staff Survey patient uh, safety questions, but caveat there that the information is drawn uh, from the same uh, staff survey and sometimes it's stronger to use evidence outside of that which the other information here does. So team working, appraisal, a drop in sickness absence, lower burnout again which was spoken to uh, and was included as an index in the staff survey last year for the first time utilising the Copenhagen burnout index and we're trying to understand more of that as we build that trend data into future years. Uh, employee engagement also correlates with positive financial performance by CQC indicators and also by reduced agency spend. So to give a bit more information, a bit more of a visual for you, looking at the sub-themes of engagement um, and inpatient satisfaction. So this is using the quality of patient experience measured by inpatient satisfaction in acute trust and shows here how it's strongly linked with engagement. So patient satisfaction is significantly higher in trust with higher levels of employee engagement. And particularly, the main driver for this is the advocacy dimension of engagement, which by far is the highest correlation with patient satisfaction. And you can see that here rising up to 8.2 uh, with a higher advocacy rates. And again, importantly, uh, as an outcome for patient mortality, 
Um, and the study here and the links to the um, resource and research papers is given on the bottom right hand side. Jeremy Dawson works really closely with us both in the development and robustness of the questions in the annual staff survey, uh, but also with the evidence and correlation and relevance that is undertaken since in a number of papers um, to really try and understand what the staff survey is data is telling us how that relates to outcomes and, and what that means in terms of actions that we can take after that. Um, so for an ordinary one standard deviation increase in overall engagement, mortality rates are around 2.4% lower. And that came uh, from a research paper back in 2012. Again, staff absence, something that we've spoken about and where we can see that if there's higher employee engagement in, or, in organizations, there's lower sickness absence. And the findings here, a one standard deviation change in engagement is associated with a drop of 0.19 in absolute absence rates for an average trust. Um, this re re represents around uh, 2,000 sick days uh, a year. Retention itself, and I think this very much speaks to uh, what Max was saying uh, and covers some of what Charlene was saying as well, uh, that retention is a much more complex area. Um, so link with staff leavers uh, is complex, and this is due to the several issues which you have heard kind of spoken about um, around retention uh, and how it surrounds retention as a variable, greatly affected by NHS structures, uh, by labour market conditions, by geography, and again, really specific to occupational groups um, and um, age ranges and, and protected characteristics. So it's really difficult with all that noise. You, you can't really look at it at an aggregate level. Um, the indication and following on from the speakers that you heard is that you really need to go down to the detailed occupational group and by different variables to really understand what's happening in a really localised area to build uh, really sound initiatives to support retention. However, in 2020, there were firmer and stronger links between engagement and morale and leave rates such that trusts with higher engagement and better morale saw fewer staff leaving the NHS. And that again suggests post-COVID-19 when that's taken its toll, where the data was kind of really all over the place because of the impact of COVID on the NHS staff survey, that lower engagement and poor morale were associated with more people leaving the NHS. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of our measurement? Um, and it's not a great picture here. Um, this black line shows you where we were with employee engagement, which is kind of showing a steady increase from previous years. Uh, in 2020, that was kind of held at 7.04. All scores uh, for these themes are marked out of 10, 10 being highest, one being the lowest. And you can see the advocacy maintained the health of the engagement theme, but then post 2020, so 2021, and again in 2022, we have seen quite a significant deterioration. Um, and that's not surprising, given the context that we've been talking about and the challenges that we're currently facing in the NHS and as a, as a workforce. So that shows us that the results for 2022 were down to 6.79. I mentioned that we also, also use that question set on a quarterly basis uh, with a response rate of around 120,000 people as a temperature check. And we can see that the similar pattern here um, it is, is at lower levels on a quarterly response rate. But the last one done in quarter four still shows a deterioration moving down slightly from quarter four, 22, 23 to 6.59. So what this is indicating to us is that we're yet to be able to have an impact to show some recovery or to turn for a more upward trajectory so that we can start to see improvement in employee engagement. So in terms of how do we then, which is the most important bit, um, this slide is, uh, again, really interesting and really important in terms of what we've been able to find out about organisations that score well uh, with employee engagement and do employee engagement well. 
And this is quite a complicated slide with a lot of information on here. So I'll just draw your attention to two segments. The first one is in UK PLC, so outside of healthcare. They found that organisations with strong employee engagement had these four building blocks in common, these four enablers. So they had an organisation which has a really clear strategic narrative. They had engaged managers and we know how important managers managers are and impacting on employee experience. There was a focus on employee voice and there was also a focus on integrity. This information comes from Engage for Success, uh, which is available um, on an Engage for Success website. Again, the details on the bottom of this screen here, but I can make sure they're added if people want to know uh, in the chat box. Within healthcare itself, six building blocks for employee engagement have been established for organisations that have a better focus on employee engagement and score better with employee engagement. And some of these are very similar to outside, as you would expect. So developing a compelling and shared strategic narrative or strategic direction, adopting supportive and inclusive leadership styles, again, speaking to engaging managers, a culture which is based on integrity and trust building collective and distributed leadership, enabling colleagues to lead transformation of the service, again, speaks to involvement and empowerment, many of the things that you also saw in um, the, the, the framework that was shown just before this session, and to ensure that employee engagement is on the board agenda. So you often have metrics that speak to organisational outcomes, not always do boards look at metrics that speak to employee experience and how it can be measured and where it's measured in a way that can really show its importance. Just wanted to show this slide as well, appreciating uh, that um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but there really is so much information available that it's important that we understand it in the context of organisations that we're looking at, um, directorates and teams that we're, we're interested in trying to support. So this looks at information that was provided by the National Quarterly Pulse Survey, and it was a deep dive report that covered periods of time uh, for January 2023, and that had 30,323 responses. And what this is telling us that in terms of the questions, and it is a much smaller question set that's used in the Pulse Survey, this is the rating of the questions that had a biggest impact on employee engagement. So the top one being people that felt more informed about important changes taking place in their organisation um, were more engaged with their organisation. It didn't score the top one in the sub themes, it coming down um, for scoring second with advocacy, third with involvement and two with motivation, but overall it was the most significant in terms of impact. Another way of looking at that data is that individuals that weren't able to positively say that organisations were proactively supporting their health and well-being, individuals didn't feel well informed and people didn't feel supported in their team, actually had an engagement level down at 3.98 and had a very low positive mood of 21.2. If you compare that to colleagues that were able to answer positively for um, proactive support for health and well-being, for feeling informed and that they felt uh, supported by their team, you could see engagement getting really high back up to 7.75 and positive mood being at 81.7%. 81, so again, I think this just really goes to show how um, looking at the information, the evidence that we've all already got and looking at it in a way that makes sense to the area that you really want to improve can make such a significant difference. Just quickly wrap up here with three takeaway points for action. Do that. Understand your data, but understand it to a granular level and look at what's already available. There's a, a huge amount of information on the Staff Survey Coordination website, and there's a huge amount of information available in New Model Health System. What does employee voice tell you about your organisation? Do you have an employee voice and engagement strategy within your organisation? Um, how do you look at different demographics and use that data to identify and define the most relevant actions for you? We can't do everything. It's a huge elephant to eat. So we need to be able to prioritise and make the most impact on the area where we, need, we know we need to make a difference. The second takeaway point is make it personal, behavioural. We all have leadership behaviours in this place, but again, it can go on forever. So pick 
two to three specific highly visible behaviours that resonate with people in your organisation. And this is where the data bit meets the human insight bit. Where can we create that human behavioural change and what levers are we going to utilise to do that? And the last one is dial up the communications. This is all about communicating in a way which makes staff feel that they're supported, makes them feel that they've got access to health and wellbeing and ensures that they've got autonomy and involvement in teams. So dial up that communication. But uh, that's great. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Zoe. Um, I always think it's so fascinating to find out how uh, staff data, staff, staff survey data impacts on patient outcomes. And I think there's some, some real sort of key take home messages there. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and now can I invite all, all presenters um, to, to come back to uh, the screen um, and we've got several questions. I've noticed there are a couple of questions in the chat but I can only really see the question and answers so if you've got a question please pop it in the question and answer rather than uh, the chat and we can make sure that it, it's it's considered. Um, so with Andrew, Max, Zoe, Charlene. Charlene's been shy. But not to worry, I can start with a question. Um, and I think this is for you, Max. This is, I'm, I'm sort of bringing um, uh, a few of the questions together. Um, and I think a few of um, uh, our participants today are keen to find out how the data is replic replicable across different staff groups, different settings, um, and, and, you know, so it refers to different professional groups rather than just consultants, healthcare assistants, and, and nurses. Sorry, are you, I, either I lost audio or you cut out for a second. Would you mind repeating that just very quickly? Yeah, sure. Just just wondering if, if data is available across different staff groups, so across the, the allied health professions and, and midwifery specifically, and then potentially across different settings. So, for example, community settings um, in, in um, you know, contrast to uh, acute settings. Yes. Um, so big picture, the answer is yes, that data is available. Um both so for, we've in our analysis we use the electronic staff record that has all staff and it has all NHS trusts um, and actually some other organizations as well um, we mainly focused on the acute sector and on those three staff groups doctors well consultants nurses and healthcare assistants because those are kind of the big ones and it was a big policy focus at the time but yes in principle um, that kind of analysis could be extended there is data available at least um, yeah on those groups Thank you, uh, Max. So would that data be available in, in some other reports? I know we'll put some links in, in the chats. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. Um, so off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Certainly in things like the staff survey that Zoe was saying, you will have all of those groups mm -hmm. all in there. Um, so aggregate things I'm less confident on. We haven't done similar analysis ourselves in other groups, but um, okay. I know other groups are doing that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on, on other staff groups in relation to, to the research? I can Sorry. just add that, as, as Max said, um, from the NHS staff survey uh, point of view, um, you can look at all the data cut by occupational groups, whether that's a summary level or detailed level. So you can even look within groups within nursing and midwifery if you wanted to. You can separate that all out. And that's all available on interactive dashboards that um, local managers, um, local individuals and colleagues can go and access themselves. I'll uh, pick the link out and I'll stick it in the Q&A box. Great, thanks Zoe. Um, Stephen asked an interesting question. Um, so uh, we're, we're seeing increased use of agency staff. Um, and we tend to get more money, but uh, don't have any loyalty to the service um, or patients, um, depending on, on the areas that they work with. As any of the research, this is an open question, um, as any of the research considered agency staff and that, that um, the potential culture there? The uh, Bath and Sheffield study uh, didn't look uh, at the views of agency staff, 
only indirectly we could see there were concerns amongst some NHS employees and nurses uh, about the skills and competencies of colleagues sometimes, and that may possibly reflect on the use of agency staff who come in and less familiar with the environment. But it's not something we addressed explicitly, and we didn't interview uh, any agency staff. Sorry, Joe, and I have my hand up there, but you might not be able to see them. I know it doesn't okay. always show up. Um, so um, it's difficult from a survey point of view uh, to reach agency because the information needs to be owned and have accountability for the employer in terms of taking action on it. Um, so we haven't uh, crossed that into agency, but what we have done for the first time this year um, and the aggregate national data is about to be published, um, but the local reports have all been obtained by the 115 organisations that took part was use or tailor the NHS staff survey for bank only workers this year to look at the importance difference in their working experience and why people might choose bank working and potentially agency working over substantive contracts in the NHS. So for the first time, we've been able to collect that experience data um, and the national overview should be published published on Friday, again, on the NHS staff survey website. Thanks, sorry. Um, Debbie's asked an interesting question, which is uh, becoming increasingly topical, the cost of, of living crisis um, and how that's impacting on, on staff leaving. Um, I'm going to come to Andrew or, or Richard for the, the Bath research. Is any of that starting to shine through with the research that you are undertaking? It's something we're looking at on the fourth wave rather than the data we've collected to date. But the um, the way our study works is about 80% of the content is consistent across waves and 20% varies with each wave. So our next wave will look at that issue amongst others and things like presenteeism as well. Thank you. Um, and then a question for Charlene. Um, Charlene, amongst the papers in the review, how many were UK uh, based and how many were international? Um, so Zoe asks, uh, she's done some recent background work and she was surprised that there was little quality studies based in the UK. Um, thanks, John. Yeah, so I suppose to answer that question, we had a really tight um, search criteria, as in uh, we wanted to, we included quality, um, quantitative studies with a Crowback Alpha of um, 0 0.7, which meant that um, the small sample studies that were UK wouldn't necessarily have met the search criteria. So I think it's, it's hard to say um, whether there's a gap in the evidence in the UK of studies published on, on, on why nurses stay. But, but in regard to why nurses stay, looking at the quantitative studies that fit our search criteria, there were just one paper. Um, but I think we were keen to get a global perspective. Um, and I think when we consider um, that alongside our quantitative um, study, um, Jane Ball um, at the University of Southampton and undertook a, a qualitative and grey literature study. Um, and so what we found was that we, um, when we mapped the two, the grey literature and the qualitative and the quantitative reviews, um, we were really happy with the level of data saturation. So I would say that there isn't um, necessarily a known gap in the research that remains um, but I think it's hard to say just determined on our study alone. Thank you Charlene um, and, and then final question to, to everybody um, is where do we need to go next with the research um, uh, within your particular field? So can I, I start asking Andrew and Richard that, that question? I know you've a way far planned, uh, but, but what's next for the, the research? Andy, I can see you. It's that most Sorry, common yeah. phrase, isn't it? You're on mute. Yeah, yeah I noticed that. You said it. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, for our current phase, I mean, our funding runs out after we've gathered the data. But I mean, in terms of our views of what should happen next, I mean, I think... There's quite a bit of data amassed now from a range of sources, which really begs the question about mapping out what are the priorities for change and also what's the scope for change in terms of intervention and trying to put that, put that picture together. 
which means really synthesis of the evidence and also the evidence on on interve organization interventions and behavior change and putting that together and i think you know it's my view would knowing up uh, i think my team's view is that probably that isn't going to work if that's just left to, to employers to join the dots that it needs to be the mapping needs to be done to consider what would good practice look like and the intervention really to be effective really needs to be about propagating those interventions having decided upon what good practice would look like i think it's probably a weaker strategy to present the data to employers and hope that they will make their own make the right choices it's a difficult area of organizational change it is zoe from your perspective Sorry, my internet also packed up for some of that. <laughs> what was the question there? So just thinking about what, what from a research perspective, what what's next steps? What's needed next? But for me, it's it's quite a, a focus on. There's an awful lot of evidence and research um, for some of these areas, and it's how now we turn the dial on understanding that evidence in a way where initiatives and focus has made a real difference to employee experience, whilst taking into account the really challenging context. So it does need to be contextualised. There is going to be uh, a dip in terms of where we sit because of the challenges. But if we can start looking at the understanding that we've got from all of this wonderful. Research research that we, we've had around and where we can start looking at where organizations have actually made a difference on that. There's some good case studies starting to come out now. I mean, the People Directorate is probably only two years old, so it's quite young still in trying to be able to ensure that we've got this continuation of understanding the data and making that transfer into case studies and evidence of impact. But I think evidence of impact is where people are really interested now. Thank you, Zoe. Max? Um, yes, yeah, so we are continuing work in this area, um, thinking two things at the moment going on. One is thinking about particularly given cost of living crisis at the moment, but also more broadly the kind of narrative about particularly low wage staff having attractive outside options, looking at that um, empirically, seeing if we see that happening. Um, and, getting a handle on some of that. Also, as I mentioned in my presentation, thinking a bit about line managers as a kind of area that matters for attention that's quite hard to look at. We have new data that links line managers to their managees um, in the payroll, thinking about a, if that data is good enough quality to actually use, but if it is, thinking about are there types of, do line managers matter and are there types of line managers, you know, does experience, does certain characteristics make better or worse for retention? Thank you, Max. And um, Charlie? Yeah, um, I agree with, with everything the panel said, really. I think that hopefully this morning has illustrated how um, we've got a really good understanding of what, of what the evidence that supports staff to stay looks like. Um, from, from our research perspective, it's about that positive solutions focused inquiry with a view to now um, generatively asking the questions and putting the challenge back to employers about how do we um, how do we build a, an employer centered um, offer that means that that the experience of staff working is everything that they want it to be to stay working within the NHS um, for, in social care I think that also talks to another point about how we've mapped much of the evidence um, into the nursing and midwifery self-assessment tool we're aware that there's many other disciplines working within the healthcare sector um, and indeed I think we now need to have conversations about how um, this solutions focused work um, translates over into primary and social care um, with a view to having a comprehensive offer to um, yeah, make sure that the employees at the centre um, of how we socialise this evidence. And thank you. And I think that that just draws together this morning's discussions nicely. You know, it, it's very much about what what we can learn from the research and turning it into that positive solutions focused uh, opportunities. So I'm going to stop there and give you all uh, an opportunity to, to go and have some lunch, have a uh, stretch your legs. Uh, Jules will be sharing uh, where where 
they are with the uh, scribe area, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. Um, and we'll come back um, at, at two o'clock on the dot. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you so much, everybody that's spoken this morning. Um, and we'll see you later on. Thank you.
So, hello everybody and um, welcome back after lunch. I hope you're all um, refreshed and um, recuper recuperated and raring um, to go again. So, um, welcome to all of those of you who've come back after lunch and to those of you that are joining us um, for the first time. Um, we've had some fascinating conversations um, and some brilliant presentations um, again uh, this morning. So, for any of the, you that have missed it, um, when we send the conference pack out, um, it will have recordings of all the presentations so you'll be able to um, watch, those, um, watch those again. So it gives. So we'll move straight back into um, this afternoon's um, presentations, and it gives me a huge amount of delight um, to welcome Professor Mark um, Radford, who's our Chief Nurse of um, Health Education England, um, our National Director of um, Intensive Support, and Deputy um, CNO to deliver our um, keynote of uh, where do we want to be. So over to you, Mark. Thank you and welcome colleagues. It's great to be here at this uh, conference. I'm, I'm going to just share my screen now, if I may, just to get up some slides to kind of give a bit of an overview in terms of the work that I think is really important to reflect on. I think there's been quite a, a lot of really good discussions over the last uh, part of this conference to really start to think about um, this. So I just double check, can everybody see the slides? Yeah, we got that. Brilliant, thank you. So I think it's really important to think about broadly in terms of what could good look like, what, what needs to happen and what sort of change programmes have been quite useful in terms of determining and understanding how we make material impacts in relation to retention. So we kind of often talk very much around understanding the problem, starting to think about um, what types of uh, uh, data we have in relation to some of the issues and challenges in retention and try to understand that because actually the granularity of that's really important to really then start to drill down to what types of interventions work and I'm going to hopefully give you some examples about why that's important so we may revisit a little bit of what we've done but I think it's illustrative in the way we would absolutely be supporting an understanding of what an intervention program would look like and I use one of the national ones to to, to do that uh, I think you've probably had a little bit of this today um, in terms of understanding what is lever and turnover rates and often the two can get confused when people are starting to look at data sets and of course, quite rightly, there are two two issues to be really aware of. Well, firstly, is obviously the levers. Now, what this really does uh, demonstrate is that the NHS particularly uses a system called ESR. Now, I know there's kind of lots of detractors out there who say ESR is not the most flexible tool, uh, but it does provide a great deal of detail in relation to how we would approach uh, understanding what's going on in an organisation. So there was always kind of a, a little bit of a, a challenge in terms of some of its data accuracy, but broadly it gives us uh, pretty good data at organisational level and therefore at national level. But of course, the definitional standards are really important. So levers actually are primarily those people who leave NHS services, and we've got a way of tracking that. Um, particularly when we start to look at that in relation to turnover, i.e. those people who are moving jobs uh, within the NHS, because actually in both settings, both data points are really, really important to understand. So levers from the NHS might not all be, be, be a bad thing because people might be moving different sectors, they might be still working in health and social care, but actually abnormally high and in some cases abnormally low lever rates are something really to be uh, understood. In some cases, a lack of churn, a lack of new people coming in has a equally a detrimental effect as you having too high a lever rate and therefore some of the processes that go in relation to onboarding etc so there are real operational uh, considerations such as uh, onboarding and hiring time uh, leave and notice periods as an example and I'll come on to some examples when I go on to the interventions a bit later on of the things that, that, that have been demonstrated to be kind of improvement are true but I think it's kind of useful to just revisit this because I think it's really helpful to try and understand what we mean by lever and turnover in particular within the NHS. Now, one of the factors that we need to factor in is, is a longitudinal assessment in relation to uh, some of the issues experienced by the NHS staff. And this graph really hopefully demonstrates, actually, it looks broadly at both, uh, as an example, mental health nursing and nursing turnover in particular. And you can see an overall trend from around February to 18 that's kind of on a downward trajectory from around about kind of the 7 or 8% uh, down to about kind of borderline about 6.5%. So broadly, uh, 
mapping and tracking to do that. Of course, the first blue box is uh, related to the COVID pandemic. And, and what we've seen here is we've seen a quite significant reduction in the total lever rate within the NHS. Now, there's some obvious reasons for that. Lots of people delayed retirement. Lots of people didn't leave the NHS. They stayed on and carried on working in practice. Lots of people have done a huge amount during that period. But we always understood, and when I mean uh, kind of modelling uh, in relation to what the post-pandemic environment would look like in relation to retention issues, there was always going to be a broader correction in the system. So some of that is primarily driven by those who have delayed retirement. There will be a broader set of issues uh, in relation to those who may have delayed leaving to go to other sectors and remain within the NHS, particularly in terms of employment um, conditions that were uh, less than very less than ideal outside uh, the NHS in itself. But of course. What we've seen and you can see from this data is that the stark nature of the up curve, particularly in terms of the rapidity by which to actually re establish the baseline of around about 7% and actually overcorrected to some degree um, and actually has started to kind of stabilise in and around the kind of just below the 8% mark. So it's kind of higher than the baseline that existed in the 2018 period. Now, of course, these are relatively nominal shifts here, but actually what you can then start to think about the area under the curve is that actually the, these are the tens of thousands of individuals when we start to think about the number of staff across the, the whole of the NHS. Now, quite rightly, there is a, a number of kind of assu assumptions that go into this in terms of what is the kind of lever reason category and also the age profile. Now, obviously, this is a, a great graph because it actually looks at lever uh, rates by age categorization um, from uh, nursing in particular, looking from 21 to over 70. Now, normally, the, as you can see from this distribution, if you look at the black line, the majority of the levers are, are occurring beyond the 55, which in special class status for nurses is the primary area for that to happen. But of course, what you can see in the lower uh, banding, lower uh, areas, is actually a much lower uh, number of, of people. Now, I think sometimes you have to kind of think more laterally about this. So one of the things that we start to think about in terms of age profile, particularly in demographics, when we start to think about learning disability and mental health nursing, is that the age profile demographic is very different. So when you start to actually look at this by service level, you actually start to see a really interesting pattern, which is, yes, quite rightly, you still see length of service being a predominant driver. And you see an increasing amount of that from 24 years onwards in terms of up. You would expect that. But actually what you can also see is demonstrably quite a significant increase in the people who have been working only for one to five years. So what it does tell us is those early years career issues are, are a really significant factor in people choosing whether to remain within the NHS or not versus is the wider aspects we get in relation to, to what we see in, in terms of the retirement phasing. Now, of course, one of the other questions that often is asked is, well, is, is nursing unique in that? Is are, are other professions facing the same? And actually, this is a really helpful chart because it actually looks at historical comparisons back to 2014-15, right the way through to 2022. And what you can see here is when we start to think about other professional groups, we see very, very, very similar patterns. But of course, what we also see is a, a, a little bit of a shift and, and a change, particularly in relation to um, a different professional groups. So you actually can see the band with change from say as an example um ahps through through to nurses may actually be two or three percentage points so there's there's some unique characteristics of different professional groups and working conditions and culture etc that need to be understood and I'm, I'm i've no doubt through previous presentations you you really understood that and of course the NHS has always been um, a, a huge, huge uh, supporter of um, international migration uh, in, into the NHS. And many international colleagues are working, and, and most recently as part of the 50,000 programme, we've seen an increased number of international graduates coming to work in the NHS. But, but when we start to track those um, and when we start to see it, we actually see some really interesting patterns, actually. So when we start to examine whether or not the lever rate is a particular issue for those from uh, UK registers versus overseas registers, and again, split that out between overseas and also EU, you can actually start to see that actually there is a differential here between um, international uh, graduate nurses working within the NHS and those are importantly working within um, within the NHS with a UK based registration. So again, again, the lens by which we look at the intersectionality of the data is really important to start to think about what types of intervention work. So we think about profession, sector, branch, um, as well as organisational context is starting to emerge as being a really important issue. 
And here's again, this is a good example. This is by branch by nursing. And as, as quite rightly, when you start to look at the data here, we actually start to see, as an example, children's nursing as one of the lowest lever rates. Um, what we have is a bunched position, uh, primarily uh, at the top end of that, we have mental health nursing. Um, and within that, we've got other areas. Um, uh, the way the data is actually cut, actually community nursing is, is, is separated that, but we've got an all nursing category. So, so as again, you can see the layering of the data here, which actually demonstrates in some cases, cases one to two percentage points difference between different branches of program and again other areas as well so one of the things um we've been focused on is, is is looking at some of the impacts in relation to um career uh, of uh, of nurses when they first start within the nhs and what is really interesting is uh, when we've started to look at the layering of the data associated with during the pandemic years as an example. So we're looking here at 2020, 2022, really helpful graph, because actually what it starts to look at is looking at those domestic graduates versus international graduates against the change level against the lever rate over a set position. And this is a really helpful graph, actually, because what it demonstrates is that this really amplifies the effect of early careers nurses within the NHS have demonstrably significantly shifted the number of um, levers compared to even international um, graduates who have been in uh, the NHS for a similar period of time. So there is a definite, definite issue here in relation to um, branch, uh, age, length of service, and also importantly, entry into the NHS. There are some particularly interesting characteristics that, that show that. So one of the things that, that uh, we've talked about, and I know you've probably had a number of conversations as part of the webinar today, is actually start to think about what do those interventions look like? So um, previously, we've run uh, two uh, national retention programmes. I'm going to get into the first one because I think it's a pre-pandemic environment, which I think is quite helpful to look at some of the types of intervention assessment that were helpful in terms of being able to do that. One of the kind of key aims was the simplicity of this, was actually making sure that we were going to try and reduce the variation of turnover rates across the country. Now, the reason we say that is because actually when we start to look at geography, um, actually uh, the, the lever rate in London was far, far higher than the lever rate in the northeast, northwest. So actually trying to set a target, i.e. everybody must achieve 6%, was actually going to be actually very, very uh, hard to achieve. Because in some cases, that would have meant some places like London and the South East would have had an enormous shift to have achieved. And in some cases up in the North East, North West, actually they would have had to increase their uh, turnover rate to hit the number. So we, we had to start thinking about the level of variation being the problem rather than necessarily actually trying to identify a particular target. We recognise that trusts were doing a huge amount in this, but actually sharing best practice and tools was really, really critical. And also importantly, through uh, a, a learning and uh, a collaborative was really, really critical to actually shape and develop how people thought about an improvement cycle, which I'll go on to in a moment. So we set up a significant offer nationally. Actually, we segmented all of the provider organisations into a number of cohorts based upon where their performance lay and also their geography and the layering of the data itself. So we identified a number of retention masterclasses where, where providers would, would, would be a part of a wider improvement uh, thing. We developed the retention hub, some of the best practice examples that we had, um, comms plan to really identify some of the real improvements people were making, um, as well as also using our networks across NHS employers and others. So we did have a targeted direct support programme, and that varied depending on the nature of the problems and the plans that the organisations were working to. So there was a direct support programme where um, actually uh, once the trust had identified an improvement plan, actually team members would actually visit the trust, they would work through some of the issues, they would refine the plan and then take it through the board governance to ensure that actually it matched what we were seeing within the data. We developed a, a very specific mental health retention program. The characteristics within mental health were so unique, actually, that we separated these 44 trusts very specifically to ensure that we actually we could look at the um, aspects of, of workplace culture, workplace career development in a, in a very mental health specific way to ensure that actually these groups were far better refined in terms of the action planning process. And also we kind of developed a lot of um, insight and development tools to really start to use the data we had, but actually try to use them in insights, which were really helpful. 
So the direct support programme that was identified with trust as based upon this cohort uh, position was, was set over a, a 90 day period. So we, there was a rapid improvement cycle that was around uh, confirm and challenge using bespoke data packs by using the trust zone data, but applying some um, approaches to it from a statistical perspective that really started to then start to think about what the data said and actually started to try and undertake some mis busting because in many organisations there were often huge assumptions about what was driving lever rate or turnover. Rate. So there was a real critical issue to there. We buddied up with other organisations that were doing particularly well because there was nothing better than learning from somebody who solved the problem already for you. So uh, we had a buddying system, we had trust visits, as well as also developing the improvement plans, leading to quarterly assessments against the, their, their improvement to see how they were going to improve to do that, and then to set forward a plan over a 12-month period. So it's quite intense 90 days to do a lot of work across HR, nursing, and a range of other uh, professionals who worked in organisations to get this this right. Now, when we started to look at the trend in turnover and lever rates, at this point, we were in a rising trend position. So we actually started to see turnover rates climbing much towards the near 17 percent, lever rates nearly at 9 percent. And then, of course, with registered nursing, actually, that was uh, all staff. We actually started to see very similar trends in itself. So it, interestingly, we actually had an 8.5 percent peak in relation to a lever rate compared to a 9.9 percent for, for things. So actually, nursing was driving a lot of this issue within the overall clinical workload. So the overall background position was a rising trend of, of performance challenge in relation to that, a significant shift in the overall lever and turnover rate, which again are both different, but provide a unique insight into some of the issues that are uh, driving some of this. So when the masterclasses uh, were developed, so the support was available to every trust in the country. So everybody was able to draw down support. And whilst everybody was involved in the program to some degree, there were different levels of intervention based upon that. So support was available to everybody, including masterclasses, retention improvement hubs, support around comms and communication. But targeted support was very much about some of those organisations facing some of the uniquest and biggest challenges. And of course, again, we, we demonstrated, uh, as we'll come on to see, some of the impacts of the interventions worked, but of course, importantly, to kind of separate out between both mental health and also uh, other areas of practice. So one of the things that is quite interesting when we start to look at the heat map here is when uh, we look at cohorts one to five, five being the kind of further down the line, so they would have had less performance challenges and often were buddies to those within uh, in cohort one. We did start to see some geographic densities around some of those issues, challenges. And like I said, they were often um, aggregated around um, individual urban populations, London, the Southeast in particular, for, for, for obvious reasons. But also we saw some massive variation even in cities. So you might actually have two hospitals in the same uh, city, which actually had completely different turnover and lever rates, uh, which actually was really fascinating because obviously when you then started to look at some of the drivers for that, those issues, we actually then started to get into some real detail about what intervention strategies might work. So all of our trusts over the one to four uh, retention planning process all submitted uh, plans uh, and we did a thematic review analysis with an academic team to really start to think about. So what were the big ticket items in terms of coming out? Now, of course, each and every plan was different. Each and every plan was unique to that organisation, but it was really evident that there were very strong themes coming through. Um, it was really evident one of the biggest issues was career development and progression, access to CPD funding. And also really understanding the value of uh, early career support in particular, noted by things like perceptorship programmes and the support and careers conversations that went alongside that. Now, interestingly, being a flexible employer was, was one of our big issues. And, and of course, many people would talk about the fact that actually things like uh, family friendly hours or carer friendly hours or flexibility is something that can be applied to particular demographics within the nursing population. Actually, what the data said is everybody was looking for flexibility. They were looking for flexibility for different reasons. So whether or not they were in their early career, they were looking for some flexibility around the work-life balance, whether people were in the retirement phase or whether they were in mid-career, mid they wanted to increase their hours or decrease their hours for whatever reason. We found um, actual flexibility was a really big driver for organisations, but they predominantly focused in on retirement and family-friendly hours. And it was something really important for us. 
There was also supporting new starters. And I've kind of talked a lot around early careers being a really critical period. In fact, we found some turnover rates of 30 or 40 percent of the early careers nurses, uh, particularly in the first two years of qualification. So there was a significant amount of churn in there and a li little understanding. And in some cases, quite a lot of anecdote driving some of the behavior. So lots of people said, well, that's quite common for early careers nurses because they like to do several jobs. Um, before they actually settled to do something else. And actually what we demonstrated from the evidence was that probably wasn't correct, actually. What nurses were identifying is were they being valued? Were they having a career plan put into place? Were they getting the perceptionship and development? And they were often moving to organisations that gave them what they want. And in some cases, their longitudinal career pathway remained at the organisation if those basics were done really well at the first stage. So it wasn't career hopping in some way to get more experience. And I think that's probably the incorrect lens to apply to this. It was actually very, very different from that. So when we started to kind of look at the, the modelling assessments and we identified with most organisations or our stabilisation plan. So we start to work to really focus in on the model trajectories that we identified. So, of course, we had upper, and, up, upper levels and control limits in relation to the modelling assessments on this. But of course, what, what our focus was predominantly, I'll just go back a slide uh, previous. As you can see, we started to model out what um, an increase or problematic um, uh, would be with the stabilisation rate, whether an improvement rate or, or not. What we actually started to see is relatively quickly with a simple focus around some very, very key thematic issues and some data analysis and, and, and effort, we started to see significant shifts in the uh, turnover and lever rates within, within our organisation. So turnover started to drop quite significantly in, in a broad, uh, in broadly in all of our organisations. Not all, not all. We had a two or three organisations where actually their turnover rate worsened um, and further intervention work was undertaken by the trust to identify that. Um, and But broadly, we started to see um, things start to shift quite significantly um, until um, things, uh, and this is as an example, I'll just bring it up. Um, this is the mental health trust. So what was fascinating, why they're why their kind of baseline level of, of lever rates and turnover rates were much higher than the other than organisations. There were some really interesting reasons for that. So organisational culture, there was medical, medical officer approaches in relation to this, um, and also contractual issues. There's all the uh, challenges in relation to managing uh, mental health facilities and environments. So uh, issues such as uh, violence towards staff, as an example, featured much more, much greater within some of the analysis we had. But actually, when we started to think about some of the interventions in mental health trust, that the thematic reviews were very, very clear um, around a, a safe working environment, around flexibility, around career development opportunities, around multi-professional practice. So the thematic lens was slightly different, but they applied them really consistently across the trust. And actually, we actually saw the best performance of improvement across our mental health providers um, than we did within uh, acute and community settings. So it's really good to see that actually you could flex quite quickly quickly um, an approach like this to be really sector specific, really granular, using the data to drive interventions and also pivot. So when we started to see some organisations not able to make the gains with part of the direct intervention approach meant that you could reassess that and then start to think about what other things potentially driving that itself. So one of the things that we uh, did was then to start to think about um, whether the broader analysis of this was correct, because, of course, big national programmes uh, of improvement, I'll be honest, um, um, haven't got a rich history and legacy of, of really being able to demonstrably improve or demonstrate the improvement that what do big programmes from the centre run? Because, you know, my my my, my underlying thesis uh, is that actually provider organisations, because of the unique characteristics of the work environment, are the ideal vehicle by which they should be able to deliver the change because they would understand the labour market, they would understand their demographics, they would also understand the nuances in the data within the place that they are in, but also in relation to the type of staff and also their, their type of service. So driving data points through a local lens is really, really useful to then derive a set of information that leads to a, at least a, a kind of differential level of intervention that's based upon a weighting that enables you to say, well, actually, if we were to do X, 
that's going to really impact 80% of our lever rate versus Y, which may be a good thing to do, but would only necessarily leverage maybe a 2 or 3% improvement. So it was trying to simplify the ask in a much more focused way at a local level by utilising national improvement methodologies and tools. Now, um, we didn't commission this. Uh, this was a, an independent group of, of economists from the Institute of Labour Economics who actually did an evaluation um, of the National Retention Programme. And uh, we waited with bated breath, really, to, to see what their evaluation was. Um, because what uh, we were really keen to know is whether or not you could apply a national improvement model to a local problem and to, and to deliver the solutions that you were expecting to see. And what, what the um, in Institute of Labour Economics identified is that um, it was quite possible, actually, to apply an improvement methodology from a national position with localised interventions that were enabled to do that. And it definitely identified that the, uh, the, the um, retention direct support programme achieved its objective. Its most conservative estimate of the programme improved the stability index, actually, which I think is a really helpful uh, assessment against nurses and midwives um, and, and improved their improved their overall positions. So one of the things that I thought was really helpful about the analysis uh, of this group was actually to start to think about what we call stability index. And uh, if uh, and I'll provide the link in the paper because there's a lot of detailed kind of economic analysis in it that gives you a really good set of calculations to start to think about how stable is your workforce in a single data point entry. So you can start to then map that and also track that and also then start to think about how that compares to peers. So there's a lot of really good, uh, useful information in this paper. I'd really recommend people reading it. And But interestingly, when we started to then think about their analysis back to ours was actually in cohort one, and this was their view, the highest positive association they found with the themes addressing the personal and professional needs of the nursing staff. So really interesting that they agreed with the fact that career progression and de development, fostering a compassionate culture and supporting staff is a really, really critical part of what we're doing uh, in relation to retention. So it was an, an additional set of external validation in relation to the intervention approach, but also in terms of reinforcing what we really knew from the data that was that was leveraged out of things like ESR and through uh, discussions with staff themselves to demonstrate, actually, these are some of the really mission critical things that you need to get right. So I know we've got other speakers on a bit later talking about the retention program 2.0, which uh, I know the people uh, team have been leading for NHS uh, England. I'm sure they'll probably go into a little bit more detail about how this evolved from this program. But I'll kind of leave you with, uh, I think, some of the really, really important things uh, that are just important to get right. So I kind of often would say that there are three or four things around retention that are really important. So most important is around kind of fostering a culture that, that sets value. Now, whether that's at team level, whether that's a, a sub team level or whether that's an organizational level, that critical culture is a really important doing that is a really important leadership issue, as well as also professional practice issue that needs to be gripped quite early. We've really seen, particularly within the data, that the two areas, which is actually early career and late career, are two very, very important points to actually start to improve uh, retention. So, uh, again, I say to people, there are two things you can do, very much looking at those early career support, because actually that's where you can make quite significant gains, particularly not only in relation to that, but also in their long term length of service, because that's a really effective return on investment of any interventions you make. But also importantly is the career is the experience end of, uh, of the career because actually a lot of those people who are looking towards the latter part of career leave because they can't necessarily have the flexibilities they're looking for but actually provide a really important point in terms of experience against those that are early starting to come into their career you need both you need experienced nurses supporting more junior nurses so getting those two ingredients are, uh, are really quite critical to ensure that you actually have a better retention strategy. And of course, the final one I would say is flexibility without question, which is everybody's looking for flexibility and work-life balance. Don't always assume that it's going to be about families or it's going to be about carers. Actually, everybody is looking for it. So actually, I've been in some organisations where they proudly said that they only had uh, perhaps 100 people on, on, on flexibility contracts, uh, because otherwise everybody might have it. And actually, that's probably the wrong way to think about it in the current labour market, which is actually everybody should be looking for some level of work-life balance. I and mean, good employers will do that. 
So I think there's some really key lessons from this uh, to, to hopefully impart today, which I've, I've been able to go through in terms of the data. So uh, kind of looking at the data is really important. I think a deeper understanding of the data and looking at it from multiple angles, I think is really, really critical. Then start to think about aggregating that in relation to performance and therefore the return on the investment of the interventions you're going to make to ensure that you're able to do that. And even across different sectors, we see commonality in terms of thematic requirements in relation to those sorts of improvement. So I'll finish there, colleagues, um, just to say uh, thank you very much um, for the opportunity to, to come and talk to you today about the retention programme. I hope it's been useful. And I'm not sure if there are uh, questions in the chat box. I will try and answer them, um, but uh, um, I hope that was uh, useful for you. Thank you, Mark, so much um, for that. It was um, absolutely fascinating um, and especially helping us think about um, how we use our local data to refine our local retention um, programmes. There is um, one question, um, I know you said you're going to try and answer um, as many as you can, but one that's just been um, asked about the stability index and whether it's available on the model health system. No, so the stability index is not on model hospital yet. Um, we, we we had a number of conversations around the kind of methodological calculations in the economic evaluation. And I'll be honest, they're, they're open source, so we could apply them. Um, people often use uh, different approaches to this, but we would like to start to, de start to develop a more nationalised model in relation to how we approach stability. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Um, Thank you so much um, for the presentation. I'm going to um, move us on to our um, next um, speakers now. So it gives me great delight to um, welcome back um, Joanne um, Garside um, and Charlene Presley. And I think um, uh, Dylan is joining you. Dylan Newton's joining you as well, I think, um, in terms of um, the work that you've been doing around international nurses working in the NHS. Over to you, Joanne. Thank you very much, Victoria. So uh, you've just got me, uh, but but Charlene and and Dylan and and the wider team have had a lot of input into into uh, this piece of research or the, this portfolio of research. Um, and and I want to acknowledge that that although I'm taking the credit and I'm here presenting it today, we've had a great team and everybody's cited on the papers and the publications that that um, we uh, we've published on on the topic. So. What I'm looking at today is the experiences of international nurses working in the NHS. Um, so we, we, we recognise today we've had lots of discussions about the, the workforce shortage in the NHS and international recruitment has really been implemented at, at size and scale across the sector. Um, there have been very few organisations that has not had some sort of involvement in, in recruiting international nurses. And we know as an NHS, we've got some great attributes that attract international colleagues, such as working in the advanced healthcare system, the career advancement opportunities, equitable pay structures and opportunities for continuing professional development. Uh, but overseas recruitment is extremely complex. We've got international nurses coming from many, many countries uh, with very different backgrounds and very different cultures. Many international nurses have fabulous experiences when they come and work in the NHS, but unfortunately, there's still some that don't. And it's really important that we learn from those experiences both from the positives and from the uh, the challenging experiences, so we can link that um, to strategies that could support international nurses to stay. So two years ago, we started working on a research portfolio commissioned by uh, the different regions across the NHS England, aiming to explore the experiences of international nurses working in the NHS. Um, I'm very much hearing the concerns today from, from colleagues that are, are saying that, that AHPs, midwives are not necessarily represented in some of the research. Um, and while I will be using international nurses, the research was based on, on nurses, but we presented this research in several AHP for, uh, forums and the findings are just as, uh, as, as applicable to AHP colleagues as, as nurses. 
So the next 20 minutes, um, I'll present some of the headline findings from four of the research projects that we've undertaken here. Um, some are published and some are due to be published in the near future. Um, the projects include, firstly, uh, the systematic review. Uh, so this is the first um, uh, link at the top and um, no doubt it'll go in the chat. Um, so the systematic review explored the global perspective of, of international nurses. So it really grounded us in the international context. I think two key messages came from, from that review. International recruitment and integration is a global challenge international nurses face very similar issues no matter what country that they migrate to and secondly the evidence shows that not really that much has changed over the last 25 years the second piece that i'm drawing from today uh, we call the population analysis so this is the international nurses and their integration into the nhs um, we undertook this work last year. Uh, it's published on the university website and this presents findings from 655 international nurses during the first four months um, of integrating within the NHS. Um, and all those uh, nurses came from uh, across seven regions in, in England. The third paper draws on a long-term experiences and career progression of international nurses. So again, this was undertaken last year. The report uh, will be published on the university website in the next few weeks. And this is a mixed methods review of both ESR data comparing international nurses and domestic nurses career progression, alongside some interviews of international nurses with longer term experience working in the NHS. And then finally, um, we've undertaken an insight cohort study. So this followed international nurses from that four month period through to two years. And we've captured 733 uh, experiences from that perspective. So starting with the findings. Firstly, I think it's really, really important that we put ourselves in international nurses' shoes. Just consider the complexity, the magnitude and the life-changing impact of any decision to migrate thousands of miles from home, far away from family and friends. I think that impact just can't be underestimated. So to retain international nurses, it's really important to understand why they're coming to the UK to work. What's motivating them to understand, to undertake even that significant life changing journey? We often think that salary and economic reasons are the primary motivator, but these are the results from our survey in the chart in the centre of the screen. Um, so the left hand column is uh, the positive response, the dark blue column is a negative response and the middle column is a neutral response. So you can see by this chart, overwhelmingly career development was the primary motivator for the international nurses uh, coming to work in the UK with quality of life for the, themselves and their families close second. We have to recognise, and I think James mentioned this in his presentation earlier on, we've got a very mobile workforce and other countries are competing uh, for the, uh, to recruit the international workforce. So just some things that came up from the survey, England was the second or third country of migration for uh, many of, or for 33% of the international nurses uh, coming to work in the UK. Um, and one in five stated that uh, England had not been their first choice um, of, um, of, of country to, to migrate to. And I love the phrase dreams in a bag. It's not one of mine, unfortunately, but international nurses are coming to the UK clearly with their dreams and aspirations within a bag. And with retention in mind, if we don't meet the dreams, if we don't address the aspirations, then they'll pack their bags and they will leave and go to other countries that are keen to recruit them. Looking at the profiles of the international nurses within our surveys, uh, we explored previous years of experience in both surveys and both came out with very similar results. The left-hand chart demonstrates how 270, so that's 35% of the 755 nurses have been qualified for more than 11 years. 
71% of the survey have been qualified for more than six years. So the nurses that are coming to the UK have got lots and lots of experience under the belt before they arrive in the UK. Then looking at the chart on the right hand side, uh, exploring the band that the nurses in the survey up to two years were working with. 71 of the international nurses were still working as a BAMP 3 or BAMP 4 and we just need to unpick that data to see whether that was pre-NMC um, pre registration or post. Um, but you can see by the chart, 80% were working in uh, band 5 positions. Only 13 were working at a band 6 and just one at a band 7. And when you compare that to the years and years of experience, um, you can understand why 25% of the internet that the respondents expressed a mismatch between their previous knowledge and experience to their current nursing role. Then moving on to the application process. Uh, the majority of respondents have migrated to England after being recruited by uh, an employer or a, a recruitment agent. So that, so that was about 79% of respondents. And in the main, we had positive comments about the management of that application and initial recruitment process. The things that were drawn from what makes a positive uh, recruitment process was being met by an enthusiastic team at an airport, timely transportation to accommodation, something to eat, and then shown around local amenities, and then thinking through the practicalities of things like registering with GPs and opening bank accounts. An interesting finding uh, from the survey was that 20% of our respondents had applied for a job independently. Um, unpicking this in a little bit more detail, 70% um, uh, of these had applied from a red list country, Ghana, Pakistan, Somalia and Uganda, but Nigeria is, is the, the largest number, highlighting the challenge. This, this group are the ones that highlighted challenges with finances and having to make significant sacrifices to actually get to the UK. And we need to keep this in mind. Not everybody has that supportive recruitment and application journey when they come to the UK. Moving on, one of the most significant issues highlighted um, by the, the uh, for in the first not four months was accommodation. So what seems to be happening is most employers are providing accommodation for that initial period as part of a competitive offer to new recruits. And most respondents were content with that initial offer, but some did highlight the challenges of being placed in accommodation away from work um, and those challenges of getting to work at, uh, for an early shift on that, that Sunday morning when they live quite far away. The challenge really hits three months on and finding that long-term housing for the cells within that local private rented housing market. So the concerns were that just sheer availability of suitable accommodation, then landlords that request guarantors and credit checks that they just simply can't provide, uh, and difficulty with costs, including both that upfront fees and monthly rent, rent and utility costs which leads to cost of living, which is becoming an increasing, increasing issue, not just for international nurses, to be fair, but for many staff. But focusing on uh, the responses within our survey, 53% um, returned a negative response when they were asked if their monthly basic salary covers uh, essential living costs, and that's things like rent and food. Um, so 58 and the over half are saying that they're really struggling to meet those uh, essential costs. Then moving on to, you know, whether they could spend money, send money home or spend uh, money on luxury items. 76% um, returned a negative response in, in this character category. Putting things into further context, um, looking at the box, below around 60% of our uh, respondents were married. 49% of that 60% had children under the age of 18. Yet 70% of these respondents said their children didn't live with them in the UK. They were still back in the, the country of origin. But 99% of this subset hoped they would be able to join at a later stage. 
I think I've linked this to the cost of living because it's very, very expensive, as, as you will be aware, for visas, etc. So if international nurses are really struggling to save, then they're going to be really challenged to, to be able to, to bring the children and, and the family over uh, to live with them in the UK. Then moving on to integration in, into the workforce, really interestingly, at no point within our research was there any reference to international nurses and their clinical competency or the ability to perform safe, safe patient care. But there was recognition that there's different professional realities. So we've got nurses coming from many, many, many different countries. Uh, with lots of previous experience, but thinking about, for example, a nurse from India, team dynamics will be very different. So it's they're coming from a system that's very much led by medics. The doctor's in charge. The doctor tells the nurses what to do. Models of nursing are extremely different. So it's very task orientated. Uh, families um, are, are the ones that are responsible for patient uh, personal patient care. And population health, obviously, is very, very different in some of the developing hot countries. So these are all going to form their previous experiences. And these needs need acknowledgement when recognising the support and potential development needs when integrating uh, international nurses within their new working environment. This slide presents the, the data from the long-term career progressions, and it's quite a complex slide, so I'll try and, and break it down. So this is based on, on ESR data of over 611,000 uh, registered nurses. Um, so splitting that down, 18% um, were international nurses and 81% were domestic nurses. Um, so we captured uh, that data from 2014 to November 2021 and compared the career progression from band to band of domestic nurses and international nurses. So if we look at the top column, presented, so the top column presents the number and percent of domestic nurses and international nurses in each band, the top number being the domestic nurse, the bottom being the international nurse and the percents that come with that. The second column shows the recorded progression into the next band and the differences between the proportion of international in each cohort and the proportional international amongst those who progress to the next band. So, for example, if you look at the top left-hand cell, you can see that 24.4 of the band five cohort were international nurses. But in the cell below, you can see that of those who were recorded as progressing to band six, only 15.3% were international nurses. So from this, you might conclude that international nurses were underrepresented in the cohort who achieved successful progression. The same feature occurs when we talk about progression out of band six to band seven, etc. For example, 12% of band six nurses were international nurses, yet international nurses make up only 9.5% of those who progressed to band six. I've highlighted the stats I'm quoting in pairs. Uh, and in the same colours to ease identification, but you can see that the same effect happens all, way, uh, all the way up the bands. The bottom box um, is the time to progress from band five to band six. So this means if you recorded the dates of joining the NHS for all domestic nurses, then 5.8 years later, you would find that exactly half of them have moved up to band six or beyond. Similarly, if you recorded the dates of joining for all international nurses, then it would take 6.8 years later. So you'd find that exactly half of them have moved up to band six or beyond. So progression is not only less common occurrence for international nurses, but it's also slower. Then finally, looking at the stories, the interviews of international nurses that had, um, that had achieved uh, career progression. Um, so we have nurses that have been qualified, uh, have been working in the NHS, apologies, for more than five years, but up to 25 years. So on average, uh, this cohort of nurses that we interviewed have been working in the NHS for 15 years on average. 
and we heard some real great, some amazing stories. Um, we catch the, their career progression experiences and many had applied for job after job. Uh, one person up to 20 application for jobs, but they really showed the, the metal, the resilience and that real determination to, uh, to succeed. Um, the barriers that they were coming uh, up against, career development processes and navigating the application system and the interview system uh, of the NHS, feedback that they were getting was quite vague but the main theme that was coming out of that was the only uh, the feedback was that only their NHS experience counted and there was some challenge with recognition of those transferable qualifications from your maths and English to, to, to degrees. But what really, really made a difference were managers taking time to value and experience the opinion and the opinions of the international nurses and providing a safe, non-judgmental environment with constructive feedback and affirmation. But the stories that we heard following success, there was a stark change in confidence. More senior international nurses described becoming bolder and braver seemingly having their power to influence now validated through that endorsement and promotion. And if initially that environment can create the opportunity for career development and wanting leadership positions, we see international nurses empowered to challenge, break down those barriers that once caused them frustration and delay. And often we heard that they were prioritising being a role model for other international, uh, but also uh, national colleagues um, and I just want to finish with a quote from one of the participants in this study um, I'll read it out we, can, we recently started recruiting international nurses directly and I think this has brought back lots of memories for me in that I'm thinking that this is coming up to 18 years and they're going through the same struggles that I went through I feel I've not made that much progress in these years it's such a shame we should try and learn from the lessons otherwise we'll be going round in a circle where people are coming and going without saying it's a vicious circle we really need to look at it and see where we can improve our practices thank you thanks Joanne I think um, I'm struck by the research um, as ever you know the, the numbers of our international nurses who um, kind of struggle to progress and the, the vast amount of experience um, that they've got with them, coupled against some of the fantastic um, experiences they all also share um, in terms of care. So um, thank you for a really, really insight, insightful um, presentation. Okay, so um sorry, I couldn't find my mute the button there, <laughs> Victoria. So this is where we do a handover, isn't it? And I introduce yeah. you. Yeah. Um so um I would now like to introduce Victoria, um, who we've met previously, and Dylan, who's a research fellow here at the University of Huddersfield, who are presenting um the, the Stay and Thrive uh, project that uh, um is amazing on I'll, I'll hand over, I'll stop. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Joanne. Dylan? Hi, everybody, and thanks for the introduction. Um, can I confirm that you can see the slides? No, we can just see um, you, Dylan. Okay, bear with me for a second. How about now? Uh, yes, we can. Well, that's okay. Well, hi, everybody, uh, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, as Joanne said, I'm a research fellow at Huddersfield uh, in the School of Human and Health Sciences, and I'm delighted to be here today to showcase the Stay in Five programme. So, it's one of the research projects within the portfolio that Joanne has just been presenting, uh, and it's quite a unique programme in NHS England that we were involved in as a research team. So in terms of the structure of the presentation, I'm going to talk first about Stay and Thrive and the methodology and the concepts that underpin it. Then I'm going to pass you back over to Victoria, who led on Stay and Thrive in the northeastern Yorkshire region. And I believe Ed Cox is also on the call. So Ed is the assistant director of nursing in the southwest region, and he led on Stay and Thrive in the southwest region.
Okay, so what is Stay and Thrive? So Stay and Thrive is an NHS England programme that aims to improve the retention of internationally recruited nurses using positive deviance and methodology. So the programme centres on a community of action which involves NHS staff working on international recruitment and retention and who in the first year met, in, met during four online learning sessions. So these learning sessions involve staff from 41 organisations in two NHS England regions and the research team at Huddersfield were commissioned to capture the learning from the first year and help accelerate its implementation beyond the two regions. So a quick word on research methods. So we use non-participant observation in the online learning sessions and thematic analysis of qualitative data that included interactions, conversations and presentations from participants, as well as online learning material, as well, sorry, as well as online materials like Microsoft Teams chat boxes and digital polls and digital whiteboards that were produced during the course of the learning sessions. So as I mentioned at the start of my previous slide, Stay and Thrive is based on positive deviance methodology. So positive deviance is a collaborative approach that seeks to identify individuals and groups who find better solutions to problems than their peers, despite facing similar challenges and resources. So this approach comes from the field of international development, and it was pioneered by Jerry and Monique Cernan in the 1990s. And the fundamental premise of positive deviance is that communities already have solutions to their problems because certain members possess the knowledge, wisdom, practices that can be identified and generalized to improve the outcome of others. So positive deviance was applied to stay and thrive in the following ways. So firstly, the community of action defined the challenge of international recruitment and retention and as a challenge that could be overcome through the sharing of resources and solutions. Secondly, the community determined who the positive deviants were, being those who had faced and overcome the challenge of retaining internationally recruited nurses and could share their insights with others. Thirdly, the community shared successful strategies for presentations and case studies from NHS staff from within the two regions. And then fourthly, the community designed design solutions to be shared beyond the duration of Stay and Fire program itself, such as the Stay and Fire bundle, which I'm sure Victoria will pick up on later. So I've just got a video, which I will now play, which explains a bit more about positive deviance and how it was applied to Stay and Thrive. Discovering hidden innovation. The NHS is trying a new way of approaching learning and improving. Positive deviance identifies the clear impact of uncommon and successful practices used by innovative teams and individuals without the need for extra resources, whilst constantly learning from the many individuals in the NHS doing an outstanding job. It's about building relationships, collaboration, sharing knowledge, and striving for improvement, yet acknowledging pre-existing pockets of excellence. Already successfully adopted in two regions, the Northeast and Yorkshire and the Southwest, there's much to celebrate about this new model for maximizing resources and achieving exceptional outcomes. The significant number of people who voluntarily embraced this approach to improvement demonstrates a clear appetite for this new way of working. Grounded in academic research and evidence, Positive deviance is fundamentally about people and communities, not process and spreadsheets. It relies on good communication, finding unique ways to stay in touch with our people so they continue to hear and learn from each other. Our Stay and Thrive campaign, with its push to retain indispensable NHS staff members recruited from overseas, did just that. Great improvements have already been seen. But we know that we can achieve even more, having fun on the way. The positive deviance approach can be scaled up and applied to so many other challenges. The possibilities, 
endless. The future, positive. Find out more on our website. Okay, so the main way really of framing what Stay in Thrive is doing by using positive deviance is for Jeremy Hyman's concept of all the new power. So generally in the NHS, power is exercised through traditional forms of old power. So this is the type of power that is held by a few people. It's pushed down from the top in a commanding way. It can be closed to outside input and discussion. And it produces programs that are treated as a transaction as something to be enacted by staff. On the other hand, new power is decentralized and participatory. So it's based on networks, collaboration and community. And rather than being pushed down, ideas are produced from the bottom up by people who enact them. So because of this, people can feel more inspired to join in with the decision making process with solutions being designed with transparency and openness. This can create a two way relationship between members who give things in order to get them. And in essence, that's what Stay and Thrive is trying to do. It's trying to empower a community of action of NHS staff who work on the retention of internationally increasing nurses by leveraging the principles of, old, of new power. So that's the background to Stay and Thrive and the key concepts. I'll now pass you over to Victoria, who will talk a bit more about how it played out in the learning sessions. Thanks, Dylan. So as Dylan said, um, kind of the, the the essence of this was about how did you, how do we bring um, people together, both um, those interne internationally educated colleagues and those that are um, working through recruitment, through retention um, of our international colleagues, but also senior leaders, because we know that um, this works best if we um, flex through um, new power. So ownership of those communities that are involved in international retention, but also working with um, our systems, our providers through that, that kind of hierarchical model um, through which our NHS infrastructure is built in terms of um, that, that kind of that, that approach that um, Dylan's described. So, so um, the essence was bringing together um, a community of action, empowering the community of action and um, enabling them to identify um, what those actions, that, those, that kind of positive deviant behaviour in terms terms of those who are doing more and better with the same um, resources and actually how do we how do we learn from those so in our first first learning session uh, learning um, with each other we explored some of what those challenges were how were we going to work what was this concept um, of kind of positive um, deviance how did, how did we engage with each other bearing in mind we're talking um, not just about a few teams within an organization or one or two organizations we're talking about 41 providers across northeastern Yorkshire and um, the South and, uh, and the Humber and, and the Southwest. So actually two huge geographical um, areas, um, 41 providers and 11 systems. So a huge undertaking to try and bring them together and bring them together in that virtual space and really feel um, connected. Um, it was important to us to make sure that we created an atmosphere where everyone had a voice, where everybody felt psychologically safe because much of the work that we're doing in international retention is about understanding the cultural complexities, the cultural sensitivities, and really challenging those. So that ability um, to feel psychologically safe, to be able um, to share what might be an uncommon held um, belief or um, challenging um, feelings of um, racism or um, uncomfortable cultures was, was really important. And actually, not it wasn't just about sharing and learning. It was actually about how do we take that to the next level? How do we build power for those communities to actually undertake, design and undertake those actions? So there's a significant difference. So if we move to the um, next learning session, um, please, Dylan. Um, 
one of the things that we started with in um, learning session two was those conversations around what does civility and respect um, look for, look like, um, how do we create just and fair um, learning cultures that reflect the diversity um, of our workforce in its entirety, that really put um, inclusion at the heart of um, everything that we've that we've done and um, together with um, our first learning session what we started to do was um, build that understanding through stories so each of our learning sessions opened with a, a lived experience from um, one of our um, international nurses um, sharing an element of, of their experiences and they were really, really important in terms of reminding us about what we were um, here to do, what the focus of our conversations um, needed to be and adding some um, per, a, a real personal tension um, in that in that learning. So in the third learning session, um, what we did was having he heard from our teams, we started thinking about, well, how do we solve some of um, some of our toughest problems? And what does that look like? So if you remember from the slide that um, Dylan sh shared earlier, it's this kind of coming together um, for, for action. So what we started to to unpick was understanding what our cultural readiness is um, within our organisation. What does that kind of really mean? Where where are some of those organisations that have really started to um, tackle culture? What is it that they've done, and how have they um, have they made um, a difference? But also recognising that it's not just about living lifting a model from um, somewhere over there and just um, implanting it into an organization as as mark radford said in his um in his presentation there are subtle nuances that we need to um recognize and reflect in how we implement anything um into our own into our own organizations into our own um systems into our own um teams so it was working through um with our teams what 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 was the maturity of our, our organisations and actually how did we um, reflect some of those um, nuances so there was a resonance um, with, with local, uh, w with that local um, place. So in our fourth um, learning session, we started to really challenge um, some of those perceptions of um, cultures. We did a deep dive um, into some of the really challenging data and statistics that Joanne shared in her presentation. Um, so we started to understand, you know, what was the workforce race um, equality data um, showing us and, and what was it? What were those areas that actually we could focus on that would make um, the most most significant difference. What I've run through in terms of those four learning sessions actually took us um, nearly a year um, in terms of uh, in terms of time invested in in both conversations and activities within organisations linked together through regular um, virtual communications through our um, drumbeat sessions where we brought, uh, we created a 30 minute opportunity every once every two weeks for all of our providers to come together and um, and talk about a, a kind of single single issue and keep connected um, as, a, as a community and kind of raise that um, constant challenge. So one of the things that and perhaps the most important thing that we built um, through this work, which Dylan mentioned earlier, is, is our um, is our bundle. And this recognizes um, that when you bring together a number of interactions, you're you're more likely to be impactful than a than a single isolated um, action. So the four the four key pillars of the work around international retention are there, um, and they're on the screen. And we've got um, hopefully it'll work, but we've got another short. Um, video, 90 second video that just tells you a little bit about um, that bundle and what it looks like and hopefully it'll play for Dylan
Dylan, there's no volume. Uh, I apologise, Victoria. I'll play that again. Cheers. The NHS is brilliantly staffed by people from every corner of the globe. It's crucial that we support international colleagues to not only stay, but to thrive. Luckily, there's a framework to enable this, consisting of four key parts. Firstly, it's about creating strong foundations in the months before people arrive in the UK. Secondly, it's about ensuring that new recruits feel welcome when they do helping them to settle into their new communities by pointing them towards local services like GPs and schools. Next, it's about building belonging. This relies on cultural sensitivity and an awareness of how it feels to be working and living in a different country. Finally, it's about maximizing personal and professional growth to ensure that nurses and other internationally recruited colleagues shatter glass ceilings to fully realize their potential. Everyone should have the chance to excel within health and care services. This relies on knowing what good looks like and learning from examples of positive deviance to discover uncommon yet highly successful solutions. Sometimes it's the unlikeliest innovators who solve the toughest problems. Regardless of our individual roles, we're all responsible for creating the work culture that nurtures this constructive and inclusive mindset. We all belong to something greater than ourselves. So how will you play your part? Find out more on our website. Thanks. So um, while Dylan's taking us on to the um, next slide, I think it's really important to recognise um, that the bundle has um, some significant actions in um, each of those um, four, four elements. And one of my um, colleagues described this as um, that kind of two elements. The first is around um, shining the brass, um, so to speak. So, for example, in firm foundations, one of the things that was absolutely absolutely pivotal was making sure that all of our um, recruits had or making new recruits welcome rather had um, every you know people had guides to the local communities where um, things could be found uh, what things looked like where local um, faith groups etc um, were what, what we found was um, nearly every organisation had started um, doing something like that. But actually, through through that sharing, actually, we got a better depth um, and breadth in terms of those, that, that learning. The second um, part of coming together as a, as a community is the new things and the things that we um, can do differently and innovatively and kind of I suppose one thing that um, springs to mind was one of our innovative um, communities recognizing um, the that our international nurses come with um, their dreams in a bag um, and not and not much else. In terms of setting up home, there's a huge amount to cost, of cost to that and they don't have the luxury of friends and families to pass on, um, you know, fri fridges that aren't needed anymore or freezers or, or other things. So I actually did a piece of work that said, actually, has anybody got um, fridges or electricals or other hands, other items that could be um, second hand that could be passed on to um, international colleagues as they're um, as they're setting up home. So, so there was, and that was then that was a practice that was then um, quite widely adopted um, by huge numbers. So, so it's that that kind of. Um, uh, bringing together of what are we all doing but actually we can improve on and actually what's new and innovative um, and actually it's something that we could all do very very easily. 
so so that's how kind of um, Stay and Thrive um, worked through um, this methodology. Um, it's had a significant impact um, across the um, the two regions, but also um, earlier on um, last or later on last year started being shared um, and encouraging colleagues um, nationally um, to join this um, community of action. And again, when we share um, the information post uh, event, we'll make sure all the links to that um, are shared. But kind of a couple of other thoughts. Why, why have we thought it important to share um, this approach today? The international retention work is really important but actually we're in a brave new world in terms of how we work together um, as systems to bring about um, change and working in this way we think has significant engagement and ownership the change is led through and by um, our communities Nothing about Stay and Thrive was mandated. However, we still have, we now have nearly 50 um, organisations across more than two um, regions working collectively on this without anything being mandated, without any um, funding or resource. But actually, um, they've risen to the challenge because it's the right thing to do. And actually, it's making their work within organisations and their retention of of um, international colleagues much more stable. I think secondly, um, we have, a, as I've already mentioned, there's an element here around multiple interventions being much more successful than um, and impactful than a single intervention. And then finally, and really importantly, um, this sort of work cultivates personal relationships and uh, connections it's not just about being task-based and we know that anything that is relationally um, led has a greater element of success so um, we'll stop there and, and thank you for listening to us around uh, this piece of work thank you very much victoria and dylan um, I've had the absolute privilege to, to observe the, the Stay and Thrive project in action and it really has been amazing to just see um, the way things have, have developed from that initial sort of presenting the evidence, listening to the stories, to the, the actions and the massive impact that the community has implemented themselves. So absolutely brilliant project. I'm delighted that it's, uh, it's now been scaled out nationally. So thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Dylan. And um, without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Kerry Jones and Charlene Presley. Um, and they're going to present Thinking Differently, Looking at Care Models, Behaviours and, and Generations. Thank you. OK, thank you, Joanne. And um, I think Charlene is going to get the slides up. Um, I don't think she trusted me as a baby boomer, but um, there we go. Um, so obviously, uh, as John said, I'm joined by Charlene, who uh, you'll have heard from this morning. Um, and I guess this afternoon, our presentation is somewhat different, as we'd like to share with you some emerging work we're exploring in an area that's less researched um, in the nurse retention field. And that is the influence, the experience of the job itself is having on nurse retention. So um, today we've considered many aspects of retention, such as key points of vulnerability, factors that influence retention, cultural transformation, and the high impact actions. But how do we ensure that as well as these things, the work nurses undertake in contemporary practice environments is designed in a way that provides meaning and job fulfillment? So, as I said, this is a work in progress. It's food for thought or something to consider at the moment. And Charlene will explain more about next steps later. Next slide, please. So I'd firstly like to consider this within the context of what we already know, much of which we've discussed today. We know from the data that we have key points of vulnerability, we know people at all career stages are re-evaluating their priorities post-pandemic. We also know people are making drastic career changes, especially at the early career stage. But interestingly, the same patterns of employee behaviour is being witnessed across generations in the general labour market, both nationally and globally. Things have really changed. Employers need to compete 
to stay ahead of the game in terms of creating really great jobs. And I'll say that again, great jobs. <laughs> and also ensure cultures and workplace environments are aligned to changing needs and expectations. Next slide, please, Charlene. And much has already been written and shared about changing generational expectations in relation to work and career. And we know that younger generations are more likely to seek alternative employment roles and even professions if their values, needs and expectations aren't aligned to those of the employer or role. I was lucky enough back um, in 2015 to lead work in this area and co-authored a report called Mind the Gap, which gives insight into why these needs and expectations are changing. But of course, we know that much more has been written about this um, since then. We also know from research important factors that support nurses and midwives to stay. And working with colleagues from Keele University, I conducted follow-on research exploring retention across the multi-generational workforce. Now here, whilst we did identify factors that were sensitive to age and career stage, we also identified that at the root of experience job dissatisfaction and job satisfaction, core themes were very similar. These themes are reflected in other retention research, as well as the seminal research on job satisfaction way back in the 50s and 60s, and in particular the work of Herzberg. And we've heard about them today. Next slide, please. The same themes again emerged last year when developing the recently published National Nursing and Midwifery Retention Self-Assessment Tool and accompanying retention guide. As it said in the chat, this, this tool has been based on extensive uh, an extensive review of the evidence, including a global literature review on why nurses stay that, that Charlene and, and Professor Garside have authored, and a review of the grey literature led by Professor Ball um, et al. at the University of Southampton. I think Zoe was on the call earlier and she was part of that team. There are about 116 references in total that we used to frame the development of this tool. And in what's really interesting for me is when you look at the evidence, these seven themes feature in some way in the majority of nursing retention research. Next slide, please. But I now want to consider something that emerged when conducting both Mind the Gap and Narrowing the Gap. And this relates to the job itself and how nursing jobs function in contemporary practice environments. When we conducted Narrowing the Gap in the focus groups, we heard a story that was repeated across specialisms and settings. Nurses talked about the importance of professional autonomy and how important it was to be able to demonstrate your unique role and value in the system, namely for nurses to critically assess, plan, implement and evaluate care using an evidence-based approach. They link this to building respect for their role and their professional pride. However, whilst they'd been educated to enact this complex, risky and consequently regulated role, they felt that they were helicoptered into a healthcare system that didn't always enable them to do this. And we know there are exceptions to that rule. They talked about bu the bureaucratic process driven nature of the work. They often felt that they were the ones managing or coordinating a multitude of processes. The one who made sure all the boxes were ticked often undertaking tasks and activities that they themselves did not make best of use of their, ex their expertise and experience. They considered this took their time and undermined their ability to enact and demonstrate their true value, undermining respect for their role and having an impact on their professional pride. In summary, a lot of, lo a lot of what they were doing lacked meaning to them and didn't provide that sense of fulfilment. In their own words, working in a values-driven profession. It was not the type of work they came into the profession to do. Next slide, please. At a similar time, I, uh, funnily enough, became responsible for clinical workforce redesign in a provider organisation. Being keen to ensure that this was well done, I, I bravely took myself off to undertake an academic course in workforce planning and design with another colleague. An additional new building was being planned at the time, which would see demand for nurses and other roles significantly increase. So as part of this work, I spent a significant amount of time understanding the role of nurses to identify what opportunities there were to redesign in a manner that would enable them to do their job in these new environments. 
I conducted a task analysis activity um, and that's basically recording the work nurses were doing at 10 minute intervals during the day. But actually the results were really stark. When we analysed the work distribution of the registered nurses, the first direct clinical activity was over halfway down the time allocation list, overshadowed by administration, troubleshooting, chasing things, supervision, and many of you'll know, etc, etc. It made me question, where is the RN situated in current workforce models in relation to the patient and service user? How could we model the workforce in a way that would support the RN by undertaking activities that currently distracted them from leading clinical care? Perhaps wrapping support around them rather than distributing elements of their role to others as a series of tasks and situating roles between them and the patient. Yes, very much needing to design for safety, efficiency and productivity, but also for job satisfaction and fulfilment. Reflecting on this, it occurred to me that whilst there are some really great examples of workforce design where this has been done really well, the majority of the time the work has not been purposefully designed. It's kind of evolved over time in response to external and internal drivers. And sometimes that means that often safety, productivity and efficiency may not have been optimised, never mind the work designed to motivate or provide job fulfilment for nurses. Next slide, please. I'd now like to share with you the work of Professor Alison Leary, who, as many of you know, is an expert in the field of workforce modelling. Professor Leary describes the influence of Taylorism on NHS workforce planning, and she highlights the use of a task-based technical competence model where complex work is often broken up into a series of tasks and redistributed in response to labour deposits. Namely, she's talking about the proliferation of new roles created across the NHS, which is great. But she, she currently she highlights and very recently that there were 77,000 job titles and counting in the English NHS alone. And she purports about, as well as the risks of doing this in a safety critical workforce, she highlights the impact of taskification, as she calls it, on the motivation of a values driven workforce. I'd like to recommend to you, if you haven't already seen it, the Nuffield Trust video uh, reference here on the slide where Professor O'Leary talks uh, with others about this in, in more detail. Next slide, please. Now, for those of you <laughs> uh, who are unfamiliar with Taylorism, um, it's got its origins in the early 1900s and it's a management science that's focused on efficiency and productivity. And it's about breaking down a complex job into a series of steps and training employees to carry out the fragmented tasks. Now, whilst Taylor's sort of approach to job design appears logical and efficient, it tends to create jobs that don't stimulate motivation or improve performance and, and encourages people to think about moving on. And of course, it's also important to remember the increased supervisory burden on nurses when you distribute tasks across more roles in this way. As Professor um, Leary highlights, and I quote her, more hands don't mean less work for some workforces. The increased anxiety and pressure due to this can lead to dissatisfaction. So for all the reasons described, Taylorism went out of vogue and in the 60s and 70s, the quality of work, work, working life movement emerged. And this really recognised the importance of job design for motivation, job performance, job satisfaction and turnover. Now, there's consensus among scholars that job satisfaction is a very multidimensional and psychological response. And we really form attitudes towards our job by interpreting our feelings, beliefs and behaviours. In other words, it's how the work makes us feel that's really critical. And I think this is so relevant, having heard from Andrew and colleagues from Bath this morning in relation to their findings. So in their seminal work on job characteristics, Hackman and Holden identify certain conditions under which people are satisfied by their work and they're motivated to perform effectively. They identified that to achieve these aims of motivation, performance, job satisfaction and retention, there are a number of core dimensions that give rise to key psychological states, as shown on the slide. 
They highlight that skill variety, task identity and task significance are important to experience in a sense of meaningfulness in your work. Knowing that our work is valuable and worthwhile motivates us to perform at our best. Also, increasingly, level of autonomy features as expressed as important in other research on nurse retention that we heard this morning. We need to feel accountable for our work and its outputs. And finally, we need to understand our impact and how well we're doing. Next slide, please. And Sackman and I'll go on to talk about strategies actually that we can use um, to support job enrichment. And these are included here just for your future reference. And what one of these things is, is something they call virtual job loading. Next slide, please. So finally, before I hand over to Charlene, I just want to just visit this, this, this concept of job loading. Now, I would suggest that sometimes we're probably very good at horizontal job loading, which is where we increase the number of tasks we ask people to do without increasing the level of challenge. If we're honest, we also create a lot of process that's repetitive in nature and, and, and can lead to dissatisfaction. Vertical job loading, on the other hand, is about improving motivation by removing controls, increasing accountability, providing feedback and really providing things like stretch opportunities and enhancing people's authority. So hopefully you can see why evidence based work design is critical to the retention of nurses. I think sometimes in our aspiration to do a something to address the labour market shortage that we have or to be more efficient and productive, we could potentially be exacerbating our problems. We need to consider role enrichment as part of this work and be mindful of the implications of a task focused approach. We need to design work so that as well as being safe, efficient and productive, we design to ensure nurses have a sense of meaning and fulfillment from what they do. After all, as Andrew and colleagues from Bath highlighted this morning, job satisfaction from caring for patients is in the top four reasons why nurses stay. And Charlene's now going to discuss in more detail work design within the nursing context. Thank you, Kerry. Um, so I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk you through the theory of job design in the context of the nursing profession. Hopefully this will consolidate our thinking on this emergent research and underpin our key messaging, which is to highlight the merits of designing jobs for purpose, meaning and fulfilment to promote satisfaction and support more nurses to stay. So let's look at this model by Parker in more detail. The model describes four things that influence work design. Firstly, external influences so that's the top box in the context of nursing looking back over the past 15 years there have been many changes to external influences in regard to nursing which may have impacted on job design we have been both in a recession and are now again in a period of economic austerity. There have been many regulation and legislation changes. For example, we've made nursing a degree profession, removed bursary funding and implemented nurse tuition fees. We've seen significant disruption to supply chains in Europe. We reduced domestic student nurse training places from 2010 to 2016 have now, and have now increased these again. We have accelerated international nurse recruitment and we have added many new roles into the healthcare profession to complement and assist the work of nursing. A second thing that influences job design is organisational influence. So that's the bottom box on the screen. Once more, we have seen changes in strategy and HR practices. There has been a significant rise in the demand for work lifestyle balance, and we are supporting new generations of work in work. Sorry. We've seen much organisational disruption due to the health shock of COVID-19 and there are further imminent changes as we await the new NHS workforce strategy. Other organisational influence changes we have seen relate to advances in technology, medicines and science. Our population is living longer but not necessarily healthier lives and patient expectations have magnified. 
Technologically and bureaucratically, we have advanced in our capability and many of our processes are now managed digitally, which whilst arguably are more effective, these pose a threat to driving metric fixation and micro-monitoring, cautioned as agnostic to the meaning and purpose of the work of nursing. Moving on to work group influences, this is a composition of teams and how groups interact to complete tasks. It invites us to consider how different work, different roles work together, the levels of individual responsibility they have, how they socialise and interact and how they support one another. Again, there have been many changes. Agenda for Change affected how we navigate registered nurse progression. We have new roles in the healthcare profession, such as nursing associates, and we have increased numbers of international nurses. Again, as mentioned, nursing is a degree profession with critical skilled, highly educated thinkers with a confidence in their agency and a wish to accelerate at pace through their careers. And then the final influence of John Job Design is that of individual in influence, which are demographics of age, gender and ethnicity. Similarly, we can reflect on the changes to this influencer. Our workforce is both younger and older in greater numbers. We have many skilled and highly experienced but new to working in the NHS international nurses. And we have growing numbers of new registrant nursing associates and increasing numbers of students. Competencies decree who is able to undertake the work and we have many people in our healthcare assistants that require mentorship and supervision and who work under a model of deferred decision making which undoubtedly adds increased pressure and responsibility to our already established and more experienced healthcare professionals. So lots of things have happened over the past 15 years and so forcing us to ask the question, how has this affected the job design of nurses? And when did we last consciously examine this? Our reflections suggest we are working in a degraded, messy system of constant adaptations and drifts. Responses to rising demands with finite resources has led to a multiplexity of workarounds and we need to be aware of unintended consequences. We adapted roles in healthcare to support the work of nursing, but these may have had unintentional, unintentional consequences. Some of the changes within our system design could now potentially be working against or in conflict with job satisfaction theory, meaning the things we are doing to improve the working lives of nurses could be impacting in the opposite way to that of their intention. This leads us to reflect if the user experience is different to the design. So as a final slide, in an employee market where demand outstrips de supply, retention could be improved if we map the core dimensions of job satisfaction into work design. Focusing on job satisfaction to improve retention is suggested to be an effective way to stabilise the healthcare workforce. Targeting retention does not simply mean preventing dissatisfaction. We must combine preventing dissatisfaction with simultaneously accelerating increasing satisfaction, which could be progressed through ensuring core dimensions of satisfaction are built into job design. So this model is a way of presenting what great job design looks like, what do great jobs for nurses look like? And this leads us to ask, how does this theory translate into practice in our complex system that has existing labour market issues? Now, both Kerry and I, Kerry and I, sorry, and the speakers today don't suggest that we have the answers, but we feel confident enough to suggest we can we should trust in the process. The evidence on retention is solid. And if we prioritise meaning and fulfilment in nursing job design, retention and safety outcomes will follow. 
by way of a final takeaway, we have synthesized the evidence into an optimizing core job dimensions framework. In an employee-led market, employers must think about how, design, how to design jobs for user experience. This framework details the job dimensions and job design of what makes a great job. It provides us with a framework of how to set our stall out and design jobs for satisfaction to attract employees and to support them to stay. We invite you to kick the tyres of our framework and we look forward to continuing discussing this topic and at an upcoming roundtable event in April. Thank you for inviting us to present today. Um, thank you, um, Charlene, uh, Kerry. That was really, really um, interesting. I'd never quite thought about how some of the um, jobs that we design might actually um, be working at a, um, in terms of at a disadvantage um, in terms of um, how people feel about them. So. Um, can we, so earlier on um, today, we asked um, the conference panel what they thought the next steps were um, for research. Um, we're, re we're really interested um, to understand um, what you as an audience think might be some of the areas that we need to focus um, our research on um, next. So um, if you can be thinking about um, that and putting some of your thoughts in the chat as well as any questions that you might have got for Charlene and Kerry or any of our other um, speakers this afternoon, then that would be um, absolutely great. So um, it gives me, again, I have the really great um, pleasure of um, introducing our final um, speaker for today um, and what a fantastic event it's been um, so far. So um, uh, to wrap everything up um, for us, no pressure there, Mike, um, is uh, Mike Haslam, our Deputy Director of uh, Workforce Strategy, Experience and Engagement at the Department of Health and Social uh, Care. Sorry, I missed, the, I missed the end bit, didn't I? That'll get me into huge trouble. Uh, if it helps, Victoria, when I first worked here, it was just the Department of Health. Now, uh, I, I had a few years out and came back about three years ago, and now it's the Department of Health and Social Care, and I quite often forget about the social care bit, which um, goes down pretty badly for some reason. Um, right, uh, I'm assuming that everyone can hear me okay. Uh, I'm just going to try and share my screen as well and see if that works. Uh, so if someone could indicate that they can see this when uh, I've got it up. Yeah, I can see it, Mike. There we go. Still okay. I've hopefully gone into full screen mode there. No, you're on uh, uh, the one way you can see the um, slides down the left hand side. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was having this problem earlier. My apologies, everyone. Just bear with me. I will stop sharing and try again. Uh, how is that? Is that okay That's now? Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so, um, thank you very much to uh, everyone for um, their presentation so far as well. Uh, we've heard a lot about what's in place already and what's going on. We've heard about what's already been done in the past and what seems to have worked. Uh, and we've heard a bit as well about what the overall workforce picture is. Uh, what I'm going to be focusing on within this is a bit around the strategic context and where we are at the moment. And then also, uh, as a senior policymaker at the centre of government, I'm going to be focusing on what I need to make decisions around this. Uh, effectively, you kind of set a bit of a challenge to you. Um, I'll start off with, oh, I'm sorry, we'll attempt to start off with, um, has that moved on for everyone? Can I just check? Yep. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'll start off with a bit of an introduction about me, which is partly because I forgot, well, didn't get around to sending in uh, a biography before the event, but also to set out uh, where my role sits uh, around workforce. So I'm Deputy Director for Workforce Strategy, Experience and Engagement in, uh, in Department of Health and Social Care. In practice, uh, the policy areas that I cover include uh, long-term workforce plan, 
I'm responsible for the uh, 50,000 nurse commitment. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, retention policy in the department. I'm responsible for the department's role around staff experience as well. So uh, all of the work around the people plan and people promise and so on. I'm also responsible around uh, uh, for things like temporary staffing. So that's around uh, bank and agency. Uh, I then have a plethora of slightly odd uh, responsibilities that don't really sit elsewhere. My favourite of which is NHS uniforms and making no bones about it. I don't have a huge amount to contribute to. But going back, the uh, the two big ones that I'm going to draw on, the three big ones, sorry, that I'm going to draw on today are around long-term workforce plan, around 50,000 nurses and around uh, retention staff experience. Um, a little about, a bit about my background as well. So I'm an economist by background. I worked as an economist in uh, the civil service in uh, the NHS and in Macmillan for about 15 years before transferring over to the policy side in my current role. My work has generally been on the boundary between policy, strategy, and analysis. And I mention this mainly because what I'm going to come at uh, today's presentation to this session, uh, the position I'm going to come at it from is setting the challenge for what I need to be able to make decisions and the kind of research, the kind of evidence, the analysis that I need to be able to support that. Um, thinking a bit about the strategic context that we're in at the moment, and I know people have touched on this a bit already, uh, but just going through in a bit more detail. So... We currently have 124,000 vacancies across the NHS. That is slightly down from the last figure, but is still a significant number that we're looking at. Um, workforce numbers are increasing. I think in general, we're looking at about 40,000 or so increase per year. Uh, within that, there's about 10,000 or so nurses, about 4,000 or so doctors. But what is very clear is that uh, the increase in supply is not keeping pace with demand. Uh, and as a result, uh, pressure is not really reducing. Part of this is undoubtedly down to the demographic challenges that we have. We know we have uh, an aging population. We also know we have uh, a population living with uh, greater numbers and greater severity of comorbidities and so on. There is likely also to be a productivity uh, challenge because a lot of the measures that have been in place over the last few years through the pandemic uh, around infection prevention and control and that have had a bit of a drag on productivity. Similarly, there are also issues at the moment around uh, getting people out of hospital, which again is a bit of a drag on productivity. But the broad gist of it is that the pressure is not decreasing in spite of the workforce increasing at quite a significant rate. Um, Talking specifically about 50k and the 50,000 nurse commitment, we are well on the way to meeting the target. As of December last year, so December 22, we had 38,000 more nurses working in the NHS compared to September 2019. But the overall vacancy rate has not really decreased. It's still around 10 to 11 percent which again suggests that we are uh, we're not really making a dent in the gap that there is, even though uh, numbers are growing at a faster rate than I think we've ever had before, certainly uh, over comparable uh, periods where, uh, sorry, over comparable statistics that are available. Um, another bit on the uh, context side, the staff survey is setting out quite a difficult picture at the moment and retention is currently pretty challenging. Uh, and we'll come on to this in a bit more detail in the next slide. Um, Retention rates improved at the outset of the pandemic and then they've since declined quite markedly and lever rates are currently about where we were back in 2013-2014 kind of time. Obviously, industrial action has not been helpful over the last few months, uh, both the causes of it and the fact that it's going ahead itself. Uh, and the impact of that is potentially going to be quite long term. Uh, and I think it's important as well that we make mention of the impact of retention on productivity. So keeping members of staff who are experienced, who know the practice, who know the unwritten processes in place within particular hospitals or wards is very helpful. Uh, in comparison, having new recruits means that they generally will need to learn the ropes. And so your productivity will take a bit of a dip through that, as well as uh, a bit of a gap when you are going through recruitment exercises to fill uh, vacancies and so on. Moving on to uh, lever rates. Uh, so these are headline lever rates from the uh, NHS digital data. There are different measures of this, and I know Mark went through some of this earlier on. Um, some of the lever rates that we see include moves around the system, some include career breaks, some include people moving to non-clinical roles and so on. But regardless of what stats you look at, you get pretty much the same picture. Uh, from about 25 15, 2016 onwards, we have seen general declines in the uh, lever rate, so an improvement in the retention position. This was turbocharged at the outset 
upset of the pandemic as people made decisions to stay in the NHS to help the effort of fighting the pandemic. But then we have seen uh, increases in the leave rate since then that have gone over and above where we were beforehand and, as I said, back to kind of 2013, 2014 levels. And earlier on in James's presentation, he talked a bit about the costs of this, the cost of uh, recruitment, the cost of filling gaps, particularly around bank and agency and so on, uh, as well as the um, challenges that you have bringing people in, and particularly if you're needing to bring large numbers of people in. There is a big question as to why, uh, and particularly why are we seeing increases in the leave rate over the last few years? Uh, there's certainly a challenging context, which is likely to be uh, one of the factors influencing it. Uh, we think there were people who delayed leave plans at the start of the pandemic, and some of that has been coming through since. Uh, though, as we've dug into it, we don't think that's so much about delayed retirement. We, th we think it's more about delayed um, leaving of people who aren't going yet for retirement. Uh, but we do also think that there is a, uh, a bit of a reassessment for some people of their work-life balance and either moving towards part-time hours or potentially looking to leave the NHS and move to less pressurised environments completely. Uh, the important thing in this is we are not certain. I think these are all plausible theories that we've got increasing evidence around, but I don't think there is anything yet that we can point to that gives a definitive picture. Um, and a bit more on the context. Um, so what happens if we retain someone is that your workforce is higher, well, our workforce sorry, is higher than it would otherwise be. If we keep someone in who would otherwise have left, we've got one more person. On the other hand, the other ways of filling gaps uh, around domestic recruitment or international recruitment um, will take time. International recruitment for a nurse, we're generally looking at six to nine months. For a doctor, we're generally looking at 12 months plus. Uh, in terms of domestic training, it's three years to train a nurse or an allied health professional. It's five years to train a doctor to foundation level, uh, foundation year one level, uh, and 12 to 15 years to train a consultant or a GP. Uh, whereas if you retain someone, you have them, uh, you have them in the system immediately. Um, however, uh, what is also the case is that retention is likely to be insufficient on its own. So I think James's summary of it earlier is necessary, but insufficient is pretty spot on from our point of view. Taking nurses as an example, we've got, and I'm going to simplify the maths here just for the sake of uh, making it a bit easier. We've got about 350,000 nurses working across the NHS at the moment. If we improve the retention rate by 2%, which would be a huge improvement in uh, the historical context, that is only, and I use the word only quite advisedly, 7,000 nurses nurses and that compares to 20 to 25,000 nurses that we uh, train domestically each year and in the region of 20,000 nurses that we are bringing in internationally each year at the moment as well through the 50,000 nurse program. So I think the summary of uh, retention as necessary but not necessarily sufficient on its own is spot on. Um, and then, uh, but thinking about the strategic context around this as well, uh, within the 50,000 nurse program, retention is one of the three main work streams alongside domestic recruitment and international recruitment. What I think is helpful for people to be aware of within this is both domestic and international recruitment give me as the uh, um, program lead for this a degree of certainty. We put money into international recruitment and we can be reasonably certain what comes out the other end. But similarly, we put money into domestic training and again, we can be reasonably certain what comes out the other end. I don't think we can say the same about retention. That's partly due to the confounding factors of the uh, uh, pandemic over the last few years. And it's also partly because I don't think we genuinely know the impact of some of the policies that we put in place. We can give a broad direction of travel. But if I were to ask what is the impact of the retention program that is going on within the 50k uh, work at the moment or the retention work more generally from NHSE, I don't think we can get a definitive answer as to what we think it's going to do in terms of uh, uh, increasing numbers in the NHS. Um, it is also going to be a big part of the forthcoming long-term workforce plan. Um, uh, and, and again, part of the reason being that, you know, you go back to the training periods that you're looking at. If we are looking to increase the size of the workforce, which we very much are, retention is going to be one of the most valuable things that we can do in the short term, as well as then medium term, long term as well, but particularly in the short term, because the increase in domestic training will take time to filter through. Um a lot of the work that is happening within the 50,000 nurse work and indeed within the long-term workforce plan is building our, uh, building on the work that's been done through the people plan and promoted through the people promise. Uh, and I think uh, from my point of view, again, um, it's important to draw a distinction in this because I think it's very it, it's very much focused on the kind of improving the culture of the NHS and improving the experience of people working within it, which is beneficial in and of itself and, and the right thing to do. But it's also beneficial and helpful for retention of staff in the short, medium and long term. And I think we need to have that kind of dual aim in mind as we do in all of the work around this. Um, 
And I think it's also important to mention uh, some of the other factors that influence retention alongside staff experience, so uh, pay, pensions, uh, terms and conditions more generally. I think professional development, career progression, and I think uh, Kerry and Charlene were talking about some of the evidence around job satisfaction and the like, and uh, and uh, the evidence-based work design as all key factors alongside people's experience at work too. Um, and as well as you know, factors that are beyond the control of the NHS, so there will be in, and going back to the kind of certainty that uh, domestic and international recruitment offer that retention doesn't, what we have is uh, trying to monitor and trying to kind of predict the decisions of 350 odd thousand people as to whether they will st stay or go within the nursing population, uh, with us only able to influence some of that. So I'm going to move on now to the challenge that I am going to set. Um, so we have very we have broad consensus over the factors that affect retention, but what we don't have is good information about what's important. And I'm going to quote from the uh, IFS report that came out in I think August last year uh, that said, however, the evidence on which factors matter for retention of existing staff remains scarce. And I think that is pretty accurate from everything that I've dug into around this. Um, what I would like to see, and I'll come on to this in more detail, but I don't know what the best return on investment is, and that's both between different uh, interventions that are aimed at improving retention and also between, say, uh, retention and domestic recruitment or international recruitment. Uh, I don't know what the value for money of this is and so on. Um, I don't know whether there are interventions around this that we would, we would describe as must-dos. I think the uh, five key interventions that uh, Libby talked through earlier that are part of the retention programme in uh, the NHS England are running around the 50k programme and more generally are all very sensible and there's no argument with them. But are they the most important? Uh, which of them is the most important? Are there other bits within that that should be being done but aren't? Um, and Another question that I've got is, is it possible to isolate the impact of individual interventions or are we looking at a broad package? Um, and this becomes important because if we can't do everything or if there, the headspace isn't there, which I think is particularly important in the current context, if the headspace isn't there to do everything, what do we prioritise? Uh, and then following on from that, does that prioritisation depend on the starting position or factors within a local area that are beyond the influence of the health system? So, for example, uh, we know we would expect... Um, to have higher uh, turnover, higher lever rates in places like London or Manchester or Birmingham and so on, because there are few, uh, more opportunities than there might be in places like Lincolnshire or Cornwall. Similarly, if you start off with an older population, the likelihood, uh, an older popula workforce population, though, sorry, the uh, likelihood is that your lever rate will be higher as more people retire. Uh, and to what extent is that affectable or not? To what extent can you uh, change that? And the other big thing for me, and the kind of in terms of the uncertainties that we do that I can't answer at this point, is how long do we expect any of this uh, to take to have an effect? So, if we are putting interventions in place to improve morale and engagement and so on, how long does it take to actually improve morale and engagement? How long does it take to put the intervention in for it to bed in for it to have an impact on morale and engagement and then on retention as well? And in effect, part of what I'm asking for here is a logic model of what are the things that we think are uh, affect retention of morale and engagement and then retention? Uh, what do we think we can affect within that? Um, and how quickly do we think, think it can be done? Because that starts getting us into what is the overall potential impact of this, as well as uh, managing expectations about how long we think it would take. Um, and so just setting out a little bit more about the challenge, it's... Um, how do we get better information on what works? Is it possible, given the confounding factors that are around the system in general and around retention in particular, because we know there are uh, huge numbers of factors that affect people's uh, decisions to stay, some of which are within our control and some of which aren't. Uh, but to make concrete decisions on this, I do also need something that is reasonably concrete, because otherwise there is a bit of um, finger in the air, there is a bit of guesswork as to what the impact of stuff could be, and that makes it quite difficult for me to argue for. So again, going to going back to the 50,000 nurse programme, uh, it's very difficult to say at this stage where we will be on retention in a year's time, and that in terms of prioritisation between domestic recruitment, international recruitment and uh, retention doesn't give, give me as much certainty as I would like leading up to the March 24 deadline of having 50,000 more nurses working in the NHS. Uh, second big set of questions is um, how far can we actually go with improving retention? Uh, what's a realistic goal? Is it possible to actually get to zero? Probably not. Uh, do we want to get to zero? Again, probably not. Because I think uh, we 
I would reflect that some people certainly retire, some people move on for, get, for good reasons to go to uh, elsewhere in the health system to broaden their horizons, to broaden their experiences and so on. Uh, but also new starters bring in uh, the opportunity of new ideas and so on. So is there such a thing as an optimal level of, uh, of retention? Um, and then in terms of the, uh, uh, the broad factors that we talk about that influence retention, are, do we think these are the right ones? Are there some areas that we've missed or are we underplaying some areas? Um, I'm always quite struck when we talk about retention, the conversations that I have uh, within the department, with NHC, with the system and so on, that it tends to be focused on as uh, part of it's about workforce engagement, part of it's about pay, part of it's about pensions. But it's I haven't had many conversations where all of that is brought together to think about, right, within this, within this strategic context, what do we actually want to focus on? What are the most important things uh, that we should be working on? Um, and so as I said, what I would like to see is a sense of what the most influential factors are for attention. And uh, it might be about individual interventions, it might be baskets of interventions, and I would like to see how that varies according to the starting position of a local health economy, a local provider, and so on. Uh, and what I would very much like alongside it is a value for money or a cost-benefit analysis or a return on investment, whatever we would like to call it. But what money do I put in to get something out? So if I, from the centre, have 10 million to spend, am I better off spending it on retention or or am I better off spending it on international recruitment? And at this stage, I don't think I can answer that question based on the information that we've got available. And that's part of the challenge that I think there is. So tempering the expectation that this is an easy question to answer, because I know that there's a lot of people on the call who've worked on this for a long time. Uh, I'm well aware that it's, it's going to be very challenging to get definitive answers around any of this. And I'm well aware that there is also a lot of work going on and previous work. And I think Mark referred to a lot of the work that he did in NHS improvement, as was uh, in about 2018. Previous work has shown that targeted interventions can significantly improve the retention rate, particularly around uh, providers that have much worse retention rates than some of the others might do. Um, I think pragmatism about what's feasible is important and this particularly goes from the centres or this particularly goes from me and my political masters in the department uh, but alongside that I think there is an important thing to bear in mind the strategic context we know we have significant gaps across the NHS and for the foreseeable future those gaps are going to be very difficult to fill through domestic training because of the lead in time and so the the focus on retention will remain uh, as the main lever that we will have in the short term for uh, increasing um, uh, workforce numbers across the system. And so continued improvements to the evidence base will be vital over the coming years. Um, in terms of potential discussion points, I've just put these uh, up for the final uh, final discussion for the, the, the panel Q&A bit. It's, uh, do we have enough work going on to tell us what works and its value for money? And is it sufficient or do we think there are gaps? And do we think uh, what's already going on around research is sufficient and uh, is there more that we think we need to do? Uh, is there anything missing from the overall work around retaining staff? Are there any interventions that we think are more influential than we've given credit for so far and we don't have the focus on it either because we've missed it or because it's too difficult to do? Um, a big question about are we good at identifying where's doing this well and actually spreading it across the country uh, and I think there's been some good work going on in that area particularly through the retention program particularly through the pathfinders and the exemplars through NHS England but is it sufficient and is it going as far as we would want and I think the other question I would have is are we good at learning from other sectors so for example teaching or policing as to what they're doing to return stuff in their areas uh, are we good at kind of that cross fertilization of ideas from uh, from broadly comparable areas uh, to see whether they have other interventions in place that, um, that we might be able to draw on so I will leave that challenge up and thank you very much everyone Thank you, Mike. And I love to finish on a challenge. And I think this is an amazing opportunity. You've got the ear uh, of, of Mike. Um, so it's an opportunity to put your thoughts and suggestions based on the challenges that, that Mike's offered. Are we dealing with the priorities from a retention or a, a recruitment perspective? Or any, any thoughts, please do put that in, in the chat. Uh, conscious that we'll be coming to a close at, at quarter past four. So please do, um, you know, get, get typing, get your ideas is there a unique opportunity that, that uh, Mike's put out there. Thank you so much. Victoria, 
do you want to go to the first question and answer if I can invite the, the uh, presenters from this afternoon uh, back on screen and um, then we'll have the, the question and answers. Um, yeah, I, I think um, the the first one that kind of struck me is uh, is again is around um, some of that work around um, kind of retention and and Charlene, I know you've got a particular interest um, in um, perceptorship and actually how we might um, be able to uh, measure um, the impact of perceptorship and whether there's any research ongoing in relation to that. Um, yeah, I mean, so what we, so what the evidence tells us is, if we can support nurses to stay the, it, to survive the first few years, then um, if they survive two years, they're more likely to stay for longer than ten. Um, so I guess what we'd say is there's a significant return on investment to be made to front load um, supporting early careers to really um, belong in the profession, to establish the professional identity, to feel psychologically safe. Um, and, and I guess as pressures increase, as the demand for nurses increases, that demand on nurses increases. So um, you, you do wonder whether, as we said about all the, the environmental changes, whether there have been dilutions that we could potentially target to focus. Um, there, there's much written um, about perceptorship and, and, and you know, the, the, I suppose to talk to Mark's, Mike's point, it's very, very different to do, to do that cost analysis, um, which is where we're very much in a place with the evidence where we're confident that we've saturated the evidence, but much of it is a, of a point where we're tri triangulating existing evidence. Um, there is actually a study that um, that's just starting looking at the lived experience of early career nurses. So as that is emergent, we'll, we'll, bring, that, we'll bring that research to, to audiences. Um, just just quickly before we go um, kind of to the next question, recognising that we're in the midst of nationally building um, a framework, not just for nursing, but for um, midwifery and for allied health professionals um, around perceptorship. Do you think there's um, a need in terms of further investment to understand the impact of that and actually designing some of that research to um, work in line with those perceptorship frameworks as they, as they start to roll out? Um, I, I do, I do. I think it does definitely cross professional and what cross professions because what we know is themes trend, you know, what it feels like to be new in a profession feels the same to be new in that profession for being a nurse or an AHP or a midwife. I suppose if we ask about where we potentially think there is a gap in the evidence, this is some work that Professor Garside and I have been exploring which is about creating and, and really supporting learning environments. Um, because what we very much talk to is we, with the perceptorship work might say, this is what you need to do. Um, and this is a framework um, and a policy of how to do it. And that seems very transactional. And what we actually need is a transformational, um, like a transformational paradigm of, of these are the components to consider um, to ensure that our early career healthcare profession professionals feel psychologically safe and supported to, um, to, to thrive. We do, have, we do have a paper actually out for publication at the moment that we can share if you would wish for that um, and to, and until that gets rubber stamped. Um, but yeah, I think it just is that transformational change um, that potentially is still sitting within our blind spot that we could look to because as Kerry talked to, it's about how work makes you feel. Um, and there's so many things and we know that priorities change across the across the spectrum of a career. And I suppose, uh, and against the backdrop of, of everything that we have to navigate in our lives outside of work as well. It, it is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to pick up on a, a couple of questions um, uh, in, in the, the Q&A box about it. we looking at, at, at um, return to practice, we're looking at, at training programmes, you know, and, and is there, there any uh, work being done on, on potentially looking at fast track or, sh or shorter options um, to increase that recruitment opportunity? I don't know whether Kerry or Mike might be interested in, in um, answering that one. 
I'm happy to come in first if that's okay with mm -hmm. you, Gary. So we looked um, at, at the outset of the 50K program, return to practice was one of the work streams that we were looking at because we thought we could get significant numbers coming in. What we found, particularly at the outset, was that numbers were actually pretty low. We're talking kind of low hundreds. And in the context of a 50,000 commitment, it wasn't really felt to be worth the effort that we were putting into it at that point. Um, so we haven't, bluntly, we haven't done a huge amount around uh, simplifying the process. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't come back to it and doesn't mean that we won't come back to it, but we haven't prioritized it so far because we don't think there's a huge amount of potential benefit there. And similarly, during the, um, I think it was called Bring Back Staff during the start of the pandemic, while we got a lot of interest, actually placing people was really difficult because what people tended to want to do when they returned to practice was pick and choose hours and work in part-time and in terms of fitting that into rotors, it was quite difficult. I think as we get more into flexible working, that should become more straightforward. And I think regardless, we should have more streamlined processes to get there as well, because we're looking at it around things like midwifery at the moment as well in particular. But I don't think it's something that will have as much of an impact as is generally uh, thought that it would have, just because when people leave the system, our experience is that they tend to leave the system for good reasons, and it's quite difficult to entice them back. Yeah. Jackie's oh. just put, a, sorry, Kerry, to interrupt. Jackie's just put in the chat that she meant, sorry, my misinterpretation about converting to perhaps uh, other fields of nursing. Is there opportunities for that to prevent somebody leaving? Yeah, uh, can I um, just, I'll, I'll just follow on from what Mike said about our return to practice, because I think, as Mike said, it probably wasn't a priority during the, you know, for, for, for the 50K at the onset. But I think um, it is something we probably need to consider as we know how many people have left and are sitting out there <laughs> that have qualified as nurses, even if they're not on the register. And um, interestingly, I was PI on a longitudinal study of return to practice that's only just recently completed um, and what's really interesting is I, I had that perception that actually you don't you don't get a full-time equivalent you know when you invest in somebody but actually what we identified was the tricky bit is still getting in and on to program because of things like placements. But when we followed the cohort through, and we followed them for about two and a half years, they actually progressed quite quickly into more senior roles and were actually quite um, quite happy in their roles. I think we lost about two of the cohort during that time. So I think it is something we could perhaps, you know, revisit and think about um, how we create some more opportunities there. I think um, in terms of the... Um, in terms of current opportunities to change things like professions, I think it's still quite traditional in that respect. I think we've got more... I think more institutions are becoming quite innovative with their part-time programs, online programs, et cetera. But I think in, when you look at the change in behaviours in the workforce, you know, in the global labour market, this is the sort of thing we need to think about. How do we provide rapid access to knowledge in a matrix of opportunities within a system. <laughs> so, you know, there's so many opportunities in healthcare in a system. How do we provide the opportunity for people to move across in different ways? And that's not just jobs, that's professions. Um, so I think it's a really good point. Thanks, Kerry. Um, well, We've got way more questions than we've got. Um, we've got time um, to answer them. So, as we said earlier, um, as we draw kind of the uh, conference and the event to a close, um, we will make sure that all of the questions um, we collate and we make sure that the answers come out to you um, next week, early next week when we send um, the conference pack out. Can I just ask, Jules, can I just ask you, um, whilst I'm summing up for the, the day, just to share your screen with us in terms of um, the graphics that you've been undertaking? Because quite quite frequently, I find that the graphics um, from Skyberia um, say far more um, effectively what we've been on about um, during the day than I can ever um, sum up in words. But I think um, we, we've heard right from the beginning of the day today in terms of um, uh, 
Libby um, and um, James opening up and giving us a really um, big picture in terms of some of our challenges, some of the things that um, people are doing, what what does the data um, look like through that um, workforce um, position and kind of reality and individual experiences on whether that's um, domestic or internationally um, retained retention elements um, for staff and um, then through to uh, Mark's um, conversations around um, data and um, data and interventions and some very um, interesting questions that um, Mike's posed and we'll make sure that we um, share all of those questions so um, you can help with your home we'll help you with your homework uh, Mike in terms of um, answering those um, policy um, challenges so an absolutely fantastic day and um, thank you so much um, colleagues for um, coming with us um, on the journey through the day and um, 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 being really interactive in the in the chat box in terms of your thoughts, comments, and questions, um, Joanne. Um, and just a, a massive thank you uh, from me for all the presenters. Um, I've learned so much today, um, and I've, I've thought I knew um, the research in this area, but really learned so much. And I hope it's been an opportunity for you uh, attending the conference, really to to reflect and learn from uh, the fabulous research that's been done in this area, uh, with the with the potential of of, of making a difference in practice. Um, I'll leave the scribe area for you to reflect on and we've got an evaluation form that's been posted in the chat um, and as we say next week we'll send out the full conference pack uh, which I hope you can share with your colleagues. Thank you everybody. <laughs>